In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I finally printed that prayer off in English. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Direct, we beseech thee, O Lord, our prayers and actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every work of ours may always begin with Thee, and through Thee come to completion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So welcome back. Um, unfortunately, for the next couple of weeks, there's going to be on and off, on and off, because... We have Holy Week coming up, and then we also have um, this hall. I guess this has been rented out or something a couple different times So on a Tuesday. So we'll have to juggle things for the next. But we could probably wrap everything up in four more weeks, I would presume. But the next week, because it's already Holy Week, might be good maybe to not have something. Um, because all the festivities, it's difficult to get everything ready. And then the whole Easter week, um, Easter week we already have that this the halls rented out, so we're not able to be here on Easter week, so Tuesday. So we'll we'll keep thinking about what the, how to how to move forward. So now let's get into the mass. The first thing I wanted to address was I was asked when you when you go to participate for your first time, like at Latin mass, and you're dealing with the liturgy that now is uh, directed uh, directly towards God and seems to turn its back on you is what it seems if you've never participated in it before. That's the language we use today. Not realizing that the liturgy is for God, so we feel like God's kind of... So we're not sure how to participate when we don't understand really what's going on. We haven't picked up the rhythm yet on how to move through the Mass, how to follow the Mass, how we're supposed to participate in the Mass what that axio is of our prayer uh, in the participation. Well, first and foremost, um, it's like anything. I mean, learning a new language, you're lost. I don't know if anybody's been to another country where you try to learn another language, but you're lost for, for at least months. Months where you have no idea what's going on. People are talking to you, telling you to do things. After a while, you think you know what you're supposed to be doing, and still you don't know, and everybody laughs at you because you're doing the wrong thing all the time. But it's because you don't know the language. You don't know how to communicate yet. Um, the Mass is, par excellence, a, 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 sacred, a sacred language being used in a sacred way with God. So it's, it's even more difficult to penetrate into. <clears throat> so how do we, how, what do we do? You hang in there. First and foremost, you've got to hang in there. Just like learn the language, the longer you're there, even if you don't study the language, you learn it. Because children learn how to speak languages, just like humans learn how to, adults, when you get older, you go to another country, eventually it might take you, it takes younger people three months usually to learn a language, it might take you if you're older a year, maybe a year and a half, and maybe you don't even master it, but you'll be able to communicate. It's going to be the same way in um, entering into something that's so profound and of a different language and of different customs. You're entering into a culture and a world that's divine. And it's already difficult for us to understand. If you grew up in it, it would be different. But since you're entering into it most times, uh, having never probably seen it before, it creates problems with knowing what to do. We've conformed ourselves to participating through action and and word. Uh, And now you find yourself kneeling and staring at the priest's back not understanding that you are in union with the priest and the priest is offering something to God. And that's the difference between horizontal and vertical liturgy. Vertical liturgy is the divine liturgy the Catholic Church has always known. Horizontal liturgy is kind of this new way we participate in liturgy, the speaking, the priest speaking to the people, the people back. And what we'll talk about today, the entrance of Mass, this is where you get almost every Mass today starts with, Good morning, everyone. Are you joking me? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, good morning, everyone. Okay? Um, 
if we want to consider that uh, vertical, I don't know, but it seems pretty horizontal. Good morning, everyone. So, in learning how to participate, one, first principle, hang in there. Second principle would be, do a little bit of study. There's the book, um, and somebody here has brought it, but the incredible, uh, incredible Catholic Mass, that's a good one. The, the Treasures of the Mass, written by Saint, that's a small little booklet written by uh, Saint um, Leonard of Port Maurice. That's a nice little, nice little book to. But if you read some of these books on the on the Holy Liturgy, written by the saints in times past, they really will help you to understand how to open that devotion, which is your love for the Mass, and be able to pour yourself into. And that's the action of your participation, of pouring yourself into that liturgy during the uh, during the Holy Sacrifice. Uh, the little red booklets are helpful, but even if you can get a, a hand missile, those, those help out well because the hand missiles, they have everything in them. That's what really got me when I first started seeing Latin Mass was I didn't even know what the catechism was because I, I hadn't even heard the word before. And now I have a hand missile that had a brief catechism of the Catholic faith. It had all the vestments, what Mass was, an explanation of Mass. And then it goes through the whole Mass. And then it had all these prayers and things like that to... Uh, to to nurture your prayer life in the morning and at evening during the day, so you had this whole compendium of prayer just in the little book that you take to mass with you. I would encourage that too. You can get different kinds. That uh, here in America, it's real popular. The Father Lasans, and I hear he's buried just right over in Cincinnati. Father Lasans, very very famous, uh, good father that made all these prayer books and things like that available. Baroni's Press sells one now that's very very common. Angelus Press makes a very good. One actually preferred theirs. It was set set, set up very very well. It's, it's even a bit thinner, uh, but it, they're all they're all they're all going to be pricey. They're all pricey. But even if you get one that's older, that's okay. It'll it'll work too. You can get one that's older. Any questions on participation at mass? Why don't we do this? I'll I'll go through, and then if you do have questions on that, ask at the um, at the break when I have when I when I take questions. So the start of the Mass, first we want to just look at, and I want to kind of race through this a little bit if I can, but you know that never happens. So, Misa. Yo, yeah. A quick question. The Father of the Son, that's the library that I recommended, is that at the 1962 Holy Week or the pre-1965? Well, it just depends on the year you get. Uh, most of his, I, I, I'm not an expert on the hand missiles, because I just had one of those from uh, Angelus Press, and I, I always really yeah, liked I it. Angelus, but I know that as the one I have. That's right. So the Saint Andrew, is it Andrew? St. Andrew's, yeah. That one has the on, also on the website uh, pre1955.com for the for the there's a there's also a St. Andrew's on there that's downloadable, but I don't know how that's gonna help you out, but it, it is on there downloadable. But the St. Andrews is a good one. Any any one before nineteen fifty five is gonna have all the good stuff in it. It'll just depend. See these hand missiles it all depends on how they lay it out. People prefer them on how they're laid out. They, they, they like, um, when it comes to like the canon of the Mass, they're set up differently. Some people like it set up one way. Some people like it set up the other way. Some people like the columns with the English and the Latin. Some people like the Latin on one page and the English on another page. It has to do with your preference. And so, uh, Father Lasan should get a big, a big thick one. That has all kinds of stuff in it. People like that. Um, so, anyways, it, it well, really comes down. Well, I mean, it'll have it, it, it'll have the, the the catechism in there that has a nice explanation of the mass. They almost all have these different things, but they have them in different ways because they're different hand missiles. Follow the songs. What I heard is you don't have to jump around as much. I don't have one. I have a, a Angelus Press. Yeah. But Taylor Marshall talked about how he doesn't have to jump. Okay. The Gospels because they have them in there. They repeat stuff. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. He just puts them in. That's why it's thicker, probably. Yeah. yeah, instead of abbreviating, that makes sense. So misa, there's two different misas. Misas. We used to say misa. It's dismissal. It has to do with dismissal or missio being the, you can leave. You can leave. They used to say it at two different times in the mass. So there's a double. Uh, there was the mass of the catechumens was the first one when you'd say ita um, misa est. It'd be right before the, well, there's, there's two different takes on this. It probably has to do with two different time periods. But it used to happen right before the gospel. Then in other places it happened, like at Rome, 
uh, Fortescue talks about it happened before the gospel. So right after the epistle, probably they had the gradual and stuff like that, then then they would say, the deacon would say, I say deacon because the normative way to say mass is a solemn high mass. That's normative. Never think it's a special thing. It's special today because we don't have a priest and deacon, whatever. But the missal itself, even the last document, um, it was put out by Bernini and under Pius XII, uh, but it was that, um, it, it was the document on liturgy and music. Uh, it still referred to the Missal language directly from it. And this comes from the Ritus Servandus. It's usually in the Missal. Ritus Servandus is like an official explanation of the liturgy in the front of every Missal. It talked about the normative Mass was a solemn high Mass with deacon and subdeacon. After that, a sung Mass. After that, a low Mass. So low Mass isn't the Norman. Nor- low Mass meaning when you have Mass where the, there's just a priest with a server and everything said, uh, nothing sung. That's a low Mass. A sung mass is when you have either incense or no incense. Before, if you had incense, you were only allowed to have a deacon. Then there was a permission where you, as long as you had a master ceremonies. So that's called a misa cantata is what we call it now. That's a new thing. That comes from newer rubrics. Before that, you could have a sung mass where the chalice was on the altar and you didn't have incense, but everything was sung. So that's a high mass and you had the candles lit. Uh, or you had the solemn high mass with deacon and subdeacon. Like I said, is the normative way to have mass, or at least should be. Every day mass would have, would have been with a deacon and subdeacon. So the deacon would have turned and said, Ita misa est, or dimit, uh, misa, or uh, however they did it, and they would leave. And they would go, these were the people that were catechumens or penitents. People who were not in, uh, that had to do public penance. So they were allowed, they were permitted to come to Mass, but they were not permitted to participate in the Holy of Holies from the off, from the Gospel, well, we'll just say from the Offertory on. <clears throat> so the twofold uh, dismissal took place at the, uh, at the Eucharistic sacrifice, that is, before the Offertory. The catechumens, the catechumens and penitents were permitted to assist along with the faithful assembled at divine worship and to be present at the readings or discourses. So in some places they were there for the gospel and they were there for the homily or the sermon, more properly put, but were formally dismissed after the gospel or the sermon. And then, uh, and to them also the dismissal was formally announced at the conclusion of the services. That is, those who participate in the rest of the service, they were, they were given another itemisa. They were told to leave afterwards. Well, there's that. Itami says, um, go, it's, it, it is dismissed. Now, another commentary that I didn't look up to put in here um, that I think comes from a more of a historical standpoint is in, in more recent times, how far back I don't know, but there was the Benedicamus Domino on penitential days and there's the Itami says on, on, on feast days. Because on... On penitential days, you didn't leave after Mass. They didn't tell you to leave because there was a catechism afterwards. There were stations of the cross. There was some kind of penitential service. There was other prayers to be done by the Christian community, and so you weren't released. Now, you've got to remember after Council of Trent as well, the catechism had to be preached. It had to be taught in a cycle of every five years. The whole catechism had to be taught to the people. We find ourselves right now in the, in the post-Vatican Church more ignorant, probably, than what they were then. That was a big ignorance problem at the time of the Reformation uh, before Council of Trent. Because Luther even, he, he printed a catechism right away, changed the catechism a little bit, gave a curse and said, whoever doesn't follow this, let the curse of Peter and Paul, blah, 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 fall on them. And started to change the faith by catechizing the faith in a different way. And that's really where the split started to come with the simple faithful. So the Council of Trent said the people need to be catechized and they need to be catechized especially in their participation in the sacraments. So especially at Mass because most Catholics really only have contact with the, the, with the church through Mass. That's why Mass has to be in and of itself a sermon, a type of sermon. 
Now, we might think that's strange because it might be difficult for some of us to participate in Mass. So we don't know how it's supposed to speak to us. But that's why we study it. The more we study it, the more we start to realize the depth of it. And it starts to form us in our spiritual life. It has a whole depth of spirituality that's with it about sacrifice. And that's what we're going to get into now, with, uh, going through all the different parts of the Mass. Then on feast days, when there was actually that Ita Misa S at the very end, you get the blessing, then Ita Misa S, and they, uh, they go. I'm sorry, the Ita Misa S, then the blessing, and then they go. There would be the... Uh, that's because it was a feast day. It was a feast day, and they were to go home and you know enjoy the day with their families, and there wasn't going to be catechism. There wasn't going to be penitential services. It was, it was of, a, of a different nature. At the period when the, when the name Misa was first applied to the celebration of the Eucharistic mystery, the strictest discipline of secrecy was enforced. This is why we use the word Misa. Well, it's for the dismissal. Why do we call Mass itself dismissal? We know before it was called Cena Domini, because um, the, the, it was on Sunday, so the, the, uh, the Supper of the Lord, and we did on, on Sundays. And there was the, uh, the Eucharist for Thanksgiving, and it has a host of other names. Why did we get to Misa? you got to remember, during the persecutions, they were constantly sending the false brethren into the congregations to root out who the Christians were and turn them over. So to hide this a little bit from public knowledge, they called it Misa, dismissal. Who's going to think their services are called dismissal? And so they started referring to it. This is at least one theory, that during these strictest times of discipline, of secrecy, um, the mode of calling the holy sacrifice is well fitted to conceal the holy mysteries from the uninitiated, those who weren't yet members of the congregation or the, of the faith. This double, this double ita, misa, est, to, um, is this way to communicate the venerable nature of the liturgy. The, uh, the, first, the first ita misa est that happened before consecration for the catechumens and the penitents it's to communicate its purity and the second to admonish the faithful not to leave until they had rendered honor and glory unto God and had been enriched with the fullness of heavenly gifts and blessings. Sounds good, huh? So even the second one was there. We as, as uh, submissive and obedient sons of the church is to wait for the church to tell us when to leave. Now, don't we see this as a big problem now? In a lot of churches... You go, you receive communion, you walk straight out the door. Uh, big problem. The Ita Misa S comes after there's already been a Thanksgiving. We think, when, when did we do a Thanksgiving? Well, there's an antiphon. It's called the communion antiphon. There's a communion, there's a post communion, sorry, the post communion antiphon. That's part of the Thanksgiving. If they would hold on just a little bit longer, there's also a final gospel, which serves as a Thanksgiving as well. But the Isim Ita Misa Est is a sign that now, now they can leave. But we all know that we're going to wait and say the prayers at the foot of the altar, if there are some, um, or wait till the priest processes out, etc. So the organic development, when did the first, when was the first Mass said? Now, first, first point on organic development, we do not have a Mass that comes from the Jews. We don't have a mass that comes from some pagan worship somewhere either. We don't have, uh, our different rites don't come down to us from something we learn from somebody else. Well, except for the fact that they come from Christ. And Christ gave them to the apostles. And the apostles taught them to the churches that they founded. And the men that they made bishops there in those churches diligently kept these practices. It wasn't until later that these practices started to develop organically dependent on the place and the need of the people that were there. And that's where you start to get different uh, rites within the church, different ways of living this same liturgy. We'll see it more as well. There's a quote I think I have in here somewhere about St. Peter. St. Peter brings the liturgy um, as a seed to the Roman church, and he plants it, or he brings it as a tender little plant and plants it, and over time it becomes this this large fruit-bearing tree with large branches and whatever else, new branches sprouting out every year, meaning a continued organic development. We don't have a liturgy, nor have we ever had a liturgy that's stagnant. It, it doesn't just stop. 
because the faith of the people doesn't stop, nor does the life of the Holy Ghost, the sanctifier amongst his people ever stop. The first Mass, they say, was said, sometimes we have to think about that, don't we? We think, well, were they saying, were they saying Mass while they are waiting for our Lord? Did they, did they say it the next day after our Lord uh, was in the tomb? Did they start saying Mass? Well, could they have said Mass before Pentecost, before the coming of the Holy Ghost, who, who plays a part in Mass, where there's that epiclesis, which is the invocation of the Holy Ghost? Could it have happened? Mary of Agreda says that it was on the octave day, the octave day of Pentecost, so the, the Holy Ghost comes on uh, Pentecost Sunday, and then the octave day, eight days later, they would have said their first Mass. She says it that way. Others say, well, at least with Sunday, with Sunday, um, I think with Sunday is uh, the octave day, isn't it? I always get confused. These are English terms, and I always get confused on all of them. So... It wasn't said before Pentecost, most likely. We wouldn't have had it before Pentecost because they still hadn't had the sanctifier come. And uh, anyways, after, the, after Pentecost on, there would have been uh, Holy Mass offered by the apostles and then taught to others. The first, offering of the Holy Sac- the first offering of the Holy Sacrifice by our Lord was the rule and the model of the apostles and the essential and fundamental features of the sacrificial rite, introduced and enlarged upon the apostles, were preserved with fidelity and reverence in the churches founded by them and their successors. But in the course of time, according as uh, accordingly as it was deemed necessary or expedient, it was always more and more developed, enriched, and perfected, yet after a different manner, in the various churches of East and West. The Lord, a quote, I'm not sure where it comes from, but the Lord never ceases to be present to His beloved, His beloved spouse, the church, never fails to be at her side and her office of teaching and to accompany her in her operation with, with His blessing. Consequently, He, has, he had the power as he also had the will to bequeath to the chiefs and shepherds of the church the right to, to sacrifice uh, to sacrifice insti- to sacrifice instituted by himself the most natural and the wisest development and the best adapted form that is to give it due liturgical form and solemnity now simply put we can understand when it says form and solemnity. How far would it have gone if, we, if, if we're just still pulling up a... Well, unfortunately, that's what we're kind of doing now in some of our liturgical rites, but we're just pulling up a table and singing some hymns and then having the Eucharistic sacrifice. That's what it probably was in the beginning. And then little by little, after synthesizing and understanding this, and through guidance of the Holy Ghost, little by little... They became to understand more and more. So by the time we get to a thousand years after our Lord, you have certain developments like the foot of the altar prayers become much more uh, formed. And they start to express in such a perfect way what we are trying to express in coming to the foot of the altar. We'll get to that actually today, hopefully. So this form and due solemnity is something that grows up out of the Catholic experience. The, the guidance of, of the sanctifier as the, the soul that animates his church, guiding his children through this, this process of developing and, and bringing solemnity to the rites. Some of the development we could see is before, you never, you never genuflected before. I think we covered that here. It was offensive. Genuflections were, were things you did for, like you would never genuflect in front of our Lord before because it would have meant something like death. Well, you wouldn't genuflect in front of the living God if in your culture genuflecting meant uh, dead, death. We do it because for us now it's, it's grown to where we understand it as an act of adoration. You only do this for God. But it wasn't like that for, for centuries. It wasn't that way. So these forms and these solemnities, they adapt and they grow according to uh, the needs of a living, growing church. Not progressive in the sense that we push our will, 
but progressive in the sense that we follow the will of the Holy Spirit, if that makes sense. Easter liturgies have a more eastern, sorry, sorry. Eastern liturgies have a more stable and unchanging character with very little variety in daily celebration of the liturgical year. In Eastern liturgies, it says Easter, but in Eastern liturgies, uh, they have the same thing pretty much every day. They're very rich, very beautiful liturgies, uh, but you're dealing with the same thing for the most part every day. They do it this one set way. It's never been that, that way in the Roman Rite. You're dealing with, an, in, in Western culture, you're dealing with a different, we have a very dynamic. So Western liturgies exhibit a greater variety, fresh life and constant progress. Now progress we mean in a, in a true sense of, not the way we think of it today, progress like I said from that, being animated by the Holy Spirit, the, the, the soul sanctifier of the church. A progress, what we now refer to as a, uh, from, from Pope Benedict when he talked about the hermeneutics of continuity. So this, this uh, organic development is what we mean here. Organic development, progress, would, we would use these, that's how they're meaning this word progress in a sentence. For celebration of ecclesiastical feasts and seasons, which are more intimately connected and interwoven with the holy sacrifice. We get that in our, uh, the calendar, don't we? In the calendar, we have the different feast days, they, they land at different times. Uh, it's a modern thing to have, like the Feast of the Sacred Heart, the Feast of our, our, our like these, these feasts that they move around throughout the year. They were highly criticized by Orthodox uh, liturgists at the turn of, the, of this century, uh, last century, sorry, the, uh, the, the 20th century. Uh, but for us, it's completely normal, and we, we think it's a, a beautiful thing. But anyways, there. While the Oriental liturgies, for the most part, contain more lengthy prayers and greater abundance of sim symbolic customs and acts. This is important. Remember this. Their liturgy has more of an abundance of symbolic customs. Symbolic customs. You're going to see in the austerity of the Roman Rite, we're not into symbolic customs. We're not into long, flowery prayers. We are now in the ordinary form, but in the extraordinary form, it was never that way. The closer we got to uh, kind of modern time, even in the uh, uh, extraordinary form, you start to see kind of these, these colics that start to get longer and longer. Whereas if the colic is the prayer that we pray in the beginning, or you have the prayer at the very end, but let's talk about the prayer at the beginning. In the, in the, old, uh, in the, in the Roman church, during the time of the emperors, those, those prayers were like three lines long. They were these tiny little prayers that said almost nothing but were so precisely written they said everything we needed to say. Now we say all kinds of stuff because we just run on and on and on and it's more about the beauty of what we're saying than the precision of what we're saying. The Romans had precision in what they were saying and weren't concerned about the beauty of what they were saying. In this Greek Orthodox, these Oriental liturgies, there's more of a focus because you're also dealing with the Greek. This is what happened with the Roman Rite when it switched from being Greek, was speaking Greek to Latin, it went from being a bit more abundant, flowery, symbolic, to more austere and being more um, practical. The Western, and especially the Roman Latin Rite, because in the Western Rite you have the Ambrosian Rite, you've got this, uh, uh, anyways, there's, there was a couple different rites, but we're, we're, we're going to talk about the Roman Rite, because we don't know anything about the other ones. The Rome, I mean, people do, I don't know. Them. They don't interest me one bit. Uh, but you can get all kinds of stuff. If they do interest you, there's all kinds of books probably you can read about them. Uh, they never make any sense to me. I'm just interested in the Roman Rite. So the Roman Rite uh, is marked by a s significant brevity, as well as the dignified simplicity and a marvelous sub sublimity in word and action. This is what makes the Roman Rite beautiful. It, what makes it so beautiful is its simplicity. It's practical. There, when, when people go... Uh, maybe I got this quote. I don't think I put it in. I didn't put it in. But there was... Um, for the Roman rite, it's not right for us to, to put all kinds of symbolism into it. To, to be inventing all this. Oh, this means this, and it means uh, the, uh, the, the bells. It's, it, we, we use the bell because the bell is the 12 apostles... 
with the, the in their I forget the, the Holy Trinity. You, you have you good all this symbolism on the handbell that you use at Mass. Well, I'm sorry, the handbell. You just need a bell. You need a, you need a bell. You need a simple little bell. But people they say they got to have this kind of bell with the four bells and each inside of each bell. There's uh there, there's three bells or you have three bells. With the, I can't figure out what they're doing because it doesn't mean anything. Buy whatever bell you want to. I need somebody to ring the bell in the Roman rite. That you got to ring the bell. That's all you got to do. But then they go on all all this kind of symbolism about the bells. That's that has nothing to do with the Roman rite. If that if that tickles you a little bit to know all this symbolism about that bell, that's I guess that's great. But it really doesn't have anything to do with the Roman rite because we just want the bell rung. You got to ring the bell because now you ring the bell because people have to come up here. You ring the bell so people will look up there. You ring the bell. That's it. It's a practical thing. In in France, I think it comes from France. When the Nova, when the extraordinary form of the master to take off again after Summorum Pontificum, I had to travel a little bit around the world to, to teach the uh, to teach the liturgy at a couple different places, and I found the same customs everywhere I went. Everybody would. At the Dominion and Sum Dignus of the priest, you know, when he says Dominic, right before he receives communion, he says Dominion and Sum Dignus, Dominion and Sum Dignus, and they ring the bell. In a lot of places, they would ring the bell like this. So Dominion and Sum Dignus, ring. Dominion and Sum Dignus, ring, ring. Dominion and Sum Dignus, ring, ring, ring. I heard that. I was like, that's ridiculous. And everywhere I went, they did it. They did it. Well, I don't need to mention the places, but then I realized it came from a video from a group of people in France who made the video and put every custom you can imagine in there that had nothing to do with the Roman right. Now they're ringing the bell doing all this weird stuff. Well, if you even read the... And you ask people, why are you doing that? Oh, it means this and that. They'll go on to tell you all this stuff. But if you read the Ritu Servandus, what I told you about, that official rubric, that official explanation of the rubrics that's in the, that's in the missal, it says, and the bell is to be rung after the Agnus Dei. Agnus Dei, remember the priest goes... Um, and then now we have a silence until it gets to the point where it says Dominus and Dignus well the rubric just wants you to ring the bell when he's done saying the Agnus Dei because the people have to come up to the communion rail if nobody comes to the communion rail he doesn't turn around and say Ecce Agnus Dei with the, with the host see it was just a completely practical thing you ring the bell people know oh yeah I, I, I've prepared I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive communion today so you go up, you kneel down, server looks back, yep, Father, there's somebody here. So, fa- so he rings the bell, and then he climbs the steps and does the confidior because somebody wants to re- receive communion. All completely makes sense. Very, very practical. But if you ask somebody normally about, about this ringing the bell thing, they're going to come up with all kinds of flowery explanations that have nothing to do with anything. That, that has nothing to do with the Roman rite. The Roman rite's very practical. We're very practical. There's simplicity, and that's what makes it beautiful. The ancient Roman rite. Uh, just a little bit of quick information on this, and then we'll take a we'll take a break. Uh, the ancient Roman rite basically was handed down to Pope Innocent the First, and he wrote this. Well, I don't, I don't know about, but anyways, sorry. This is Pope Innocent the First. This is what he writes. He writes to the Bishop of Gubbio. There's a couple of things he writes to the Bishop of Gubbio that we know about different sacraments, but he writes to the Bishop of Gubbio. Do you know Gubbio? Gubbio is where that famous instance took place of St. Francis, where that wolf was eating, like killing everybody. And St. Francis went and made a deal with, with the, the wolf of Gubbio and said, if, you know, you got to stop killing everybody. And the people will give you food. Then, then he became a very pious wolf. And he would actually, if you go to Gubbio today, it's built on a hill. And he'll, um, they have all the places in that town where the wolf would go and beg his food every day and the church where he'd go pray. <laughs> I don't know. But that's, the, that's Gubbio. So in the year 402, or between 402 and 417, Pope Innocent I writes a, uh, he writes a, a letter to, now this is pretty early, for, in the 400s, that's still pretty early. He writes to the bishop of, of Gubbio and he says, Who does not know that what has been handed down by Peter, the prince of the apostles, to the Roman church is still observed unto this day? That's pretty impressive. It's still observed unto this day and must be observed by all. So we don't, we don't just have a liturgy that just kind of, you had a group of, the Pope said, he got a group of men together and said, work something out. You know, we need to make a missal. They didn't have that before. You, you had something that was passed down to them from the apostles and they diligently kept that. 
except for being able to expand on certain things, but they didn't change it. It grew, but you didn't take that substance, that form that it had, and just change the whole thing. That's why that missile that comes all the way down to us is the, the missile we have that stops at 1962. That's the one missile. We'll talk about it a little bit here. But in what form and how strictly are we to think of this, this, um, this liturgy given to us? I don't know who this, this uh, Kossing is, but this is a quote from him. As yet a tender plant planted in, this is the quote I gave you before, planted in, in the Roman garden, nurtured and, and assisted by the Holy Ghost, it has grown to a large tree, and although the trunk has long ago attained its full growth, it nevertheless shoots forth in every century new branches and new blossoms. We know from Pope Leo the First. See, these are the three. These are the three sacramentaries that we talk about: sacramentarium, the uh, Leo. Uh, Leo Leonianum, Leonianum, Glazianum, and Gregorianum. These are the three. The Gregorianum is the most important because it is the one, basically our Mass today, from the 1962 back, is based on. And even most of the, the ordinary form would be based on this as well. At least the substantial, like canon and things like that, though they did uh, do, do a few things. So, Pope Leo, you get the 400s. Pope um, uh, Gelesius, he's from the, the very end of the 400s, and Pope Gregory the Great is uh, middle, the end of the, the, the 600s. So these are the three major, but th the point being is in them, we have these documents and we can, we, can, we can study these. Now these documents show us this constant preservation of something very, very ancient. You don't have new missiles coming into existence. You have the preservation of something being passed down. And each one um, making stronger as they pass it down. Until you get to great Gregory the Great, who finishes the canon, placing the Our Father just outside of it, fixes the canon the way it is. And by this point in time, now, uh, see that, so these popes faithfully preserved the ancient formulas and at the same time enriched and perfected them with adaptations uh, uh, suitable to the times. So here we have the Kyrie. You can see it in that second bullet point. The, the intro the Kyrie, the glory of the collect, the epistle, the gradual, the gospel, the secret, the preface, the paternoster, the communion, post-communion. It all dates back to, that four, to the 4th century. 4th century is the 300s. Our Mass is principally derived from this one, that is the, the, the Mass of Gregory the Great, or the Sacramentarium of Gregory the Great, because he, he fixes all that. He, he brings it to its completion, for the most part. By the close of the Middle Ages, the close of it, so we're talking what? Um, by, by the time we're getting to Council Trent, it had been disfigured greatly. Because you didn't have one fixed liturgy. You didn't have a uniformity in liturgy that we have today. You had the substance of all the liturgy was kept intact. But it was, it was, it was used differently. Basically every diocese would essentially have its own rite. Because you didn't have one missile that got passed around. You didn't have this uniformity. And in fact, it's not a Catholic idea to have complete liturgical uniformity. That's not a Catholic idea. Everybody has to be doing the same thing. We've never had that idea before. But when, when the Council of Trent came along and Pius, it got passed down to uh, St. Pope Pius V, he had to finish the missile off. Their job was to carefully revise, you see on the, well, the last bullet point, to carefully revise and correct the missile. So it's a difference between coming up with a mass. A lot of times they want to make us think that the Council of Trent, they did a reform, they gave us a new missile. That's not what happened. They were sorting through... This is real liturgical uh, reform. It's when you take all the things that have grown up around the Mass and you trim it all back, you get to the ar more, more archaic form of the Mass. Not an archaic sense of a Mass already that's developed, but the essential things that have been passed down to us in, in its integrity. You get back to that, 
So they carefully revised and corrected the Missal, restoring the Gregorian rite to its original purity uh, and dignity while also establishing unity and divine worship. Now this time they had to establish unity, which I just said wasn't really a Catholic principle, because they had to save Christendom. You had, you had all these attacks on the liturgy now of all these heretical groups now changing the Eucharistic prayers to communion services. And, and we saw what happened to England. Once they embraced, they had the apostolic faith. And once they embraced the Lutheran communion services, service prayers in their book of commons or their book of uh, prayers, whatever they call it, then, then they lost the sacrament. Then they lost holy orders. And that's why they don't have priests anymore. And anybody can be ordained there in the Anglican church because they don't have... They're not, a, they're not an apostolic church any longer because they changed the, the essence of the Mass. So let's take a break. But before we do, are there any questions? Don't worry. No, remember, we didn't have a whole lot of uniformity. The, the, they always had their own, they always had their own uh, right. The Orientals had a different way of doing things. Remember, they had a different language. They had different customs. But the essential things from the apostles were always found in all of them. You'll always find in every rite the kind of the same substance. But the Roman rite was guided by different principles, different people, different culture, different needs, different, different, different un- understanding of solemnity uh, and decorum. And then the, uh, the Orientals, they had theirs. And so theirs developed out of that need, ours developed out of our need. And that's why theirs isn't really, it's not very dynamic. You have what you have. And it's beautiful and very rich, but they do pretty much the same thing always. Where ours depends on, it's more dynamic, you know, what, what's the feast day? What, what's, the, what's the part of the year? What's our calendar suggesting? Things will change and grow. There's that organic progress or the or, or organic development. Does that make sense? I'm sure others know. Well, Oriental is Eastern, so it means the same thing. Eastern, Oriental, we just mean, you know, over there somewhere. But Western is is like, you know, Europe, would have been Europe here in America. We're, we're Roman, Roman. Uh, Constantinople, uh, Alexandria, those those those, uh, those those major centers that had patriarchs, that's that's the East. Now even Russia, I guess, is considered the East. All oh, that's East. But we're, we're West. Yeah, but when we say Eastern Orthodox now, we tend to mean a group that's outside the church. That they're not the they're of apostolic origin, but not in union with Rome. But there's all kinds of groups now. When you get into Eastern, when you get to the Orthodox, when you get to the Coptics, all these different that are in union with Rome. So it gets kind of complicated. I don't really know a lot about the different rites, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, mass definition is derived from ethnicity. Well, the definition of mass would be different, but the, the, the significance of the word mass derives from misa, d- dismissal. And that's where the ita misa est, a mass is ended, you go. That's why in the, in the ordinary form of the mass now they say, the mass is ended, you can go in peace. They just add something to it. Or I think most people now, there's, they have a couple different formulas you can say, like go and like live the gospel with your life or something like that. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out where the word mass derived from. From Misa, being dis- the okay. dismissal. Okay. When they're telling you you're dismissed, the word's Misa. And so mass comes from that. Okay. Because most likely they were using that as a code word for the Holy Sacrifice, the Eucharistic celebration. Okay. So then Christ Mass, Christmas, Christ Mass. Christmas, yeah. Yeah. Mass Yeah, because that's a later development. So they were probably already using Misa for Mass when they started having the, the Feast of Our Lord's Nativity. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to look it up, but I, I, I would presume. John? So I've heard someone say organic development. That'd be like did something animated by the Holy Spirit. They were using the example that if you came to Mass one week after the other, 
you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between something changing. No. It's so close. Is that true or not? It's like it's like evolution. You know how we never see the links between evolution? It's just like that. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's um yeah, I mean it's it's just it's something that over a long period of time becomes it gets better and better. It just it builds it's just like kind of uh, grace builds on nature. It's the same thing. We have this, for example, I mean, one of the examples I always like to give is the lifting of the chasuble, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was a practical need. But then it, it also serves to show something very significant that we do serve as a, we, we do assist at Mass more than just being present at it. Um, so you have these practical needs that happen, and over time, they get given more... Uh, decorum, more solemnity, more form within the Mass, and that's where the, the beauty starts to come from, is this need is here, and so this this grows out of it. So Roman ceremonies. We want to talk about Roman ceremonies. I've already kind of touched on some of it. That's what happens when you start bouncing around. You get you anticipate things. But with the Roman ceremonies, we talk about decorum, Roman decorum. So order, we're going to talk about in three different ways. First is when we talk about it being ordered and the beauty and the adornment of divine worship. Now, some of the ways that we see this is in... Uh, now, of course, when we talk about these things, I'm only talking for the most part about the extraordinary form of the Mass. And because when I know, I know many priests who try to implement these liturgical rules in the, in the ordinary form of the Mass... And their parishioners will openly criticize them. Uh, I've heard several times from different priests that because they would try to be very reverent at Mass and treat Mass as though it was Mass, that the people would come up and say things like, Father, really, this is boring. You need to have a gimmick. To tell their priests they have to have a gimmick. What that priest is doing is he's following all the liturgical norms. <laughs> so he's being... He's, he's doing what a priest is supposed to do, and so they don't like it. Uh, in the Roman Rite, this order and this beauty, this, uh, this adornment of divine worship has a lot to do with the, the way, the comportment of, of the, the dignity of the priest. And you see that in, in his lowered eyes. Like when he walks to the altar, you ever notice, uh, whenever the priest is walking to the altar, he keeps his eyes right down below. His hands are folded in front of him. Uh, and he just keeps his eyes cast down. He doesn't look around. And now what do we see in many like ordinary form pictures or a bishop right after he gets ordained or at they're waving to everybody at mass. They're smiling and waving. It's, it, it's completely contrary to what we understand in Roman decorum. So a priest goes with a very seriousness to the altar with his eyes downcast. When, if you ever notice in, at Mass, if somebody has to do something, they'll put their hand on their breast and like turn the page. You'll see the Master Sermon. He doesn't just leave his hand out there and do something. He never just has his hands out kind of like this or rooting in his pockets or hands down, walking around with... But you see that all the time now. You'll see a, 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 a deacon, one of the, with the older... Um, well, they, they call them permanent deacons. They'll be dressed in vestments just walking around with their arms flailing everywhere they go because they haven't understood about this decorum of liturgy. But you'll see a young boy who, who's learning how to serve Mass that when he has to walk from the sacristy to take something to the chapel, he'll walk with his hands folded or he'll, he'll naturally take his hand on his... because he knows what he's doing is very dignified. He's dressed in a very dignified manner. So things that we, we learn that should be natural to us other movements during the liturgy, uh, everything's accounted for. When the priest turns, you know how every time he turns in the Mass, he'll kiss the altar, and he'll turn to the people. Whenever he's doing that, we'll go into that later, but whenever he does that, he's extending the Christ of peace, that's, which is from the altar. He's from the altar. But he doesn't look at you. He's not looking at you. He's looking directly at the ground in front of him. Dominus vobiscum. And then he turns back around. He's preserving... And having, he's giving us example for custody of the eyes, not of curiosity. You know it's always a problem when the, when the priest keeps making eye contact with you or, or looking. I mean, in the homily, that's one thing. But when he's turning around in the service of God at the altar, that's another. 
So that, that decorum, everything's accounted for. When the priest comes and he says that Dominus Viviscum and he turns around, every step in that turn is accounted for. So when, when a young seminarian is learning the Mass, he knows every single step to turn, to make that turn, to get back to that missile. Absolutely everything is accounted for. There is no I in that liturgy unless it's the divine I of our Lord saying, this is my body. The rest is the priest, the servant of Christ offering that Mass. And it's, 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 it's evident through the dignity uh, by which he, he carries himself during, during the full of the liturgy. Because every Mass should be Christ. Even when the extraordinary Mass was liberated after Sumorum uh, Pontificum, I noticed there was a lot of difference with people how they said Mass because they were trying to show how different priests would show how they were saying Mass. I, I knew a priest that would, when it came to the Dominion Sum Dignus or when it came to the Mea Culpa during the Confidier, their hand would fly way back and they would just pound their chest and their whole body would shake, right? And you'd hear this echo go through their body, this mea culpa, mea culpa, and everything would just rattle in them, right? And their whole vestment would shake. And then they thought it weird that people started to complain. Uh, we'll get into what the striking the breast means, but the point being is every Mass is to be said like every Mass. Every priest is to say every Mass like every other priest. It is Christ who says Mass, and it's the priest who... Who, who by the grace of God is ordained to stand as his minister. It's a magnificent thing. But to show that continuity and that reality of that ordination as being an instrument of Christ, the priest seeks to do what every other priest seeks to do. So we have to be careful as the faithful when we watch one priest raise up the, the host and hold it there for half an hour and then you have another priest who takes the host, raises it above his head, and then immediately brings it back down. I often hear the faithful say, oh, but the other one is so pious. Yeah, he is pious, but he, he, he I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure he is pious, but you can't say the other priest who's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing isn't pious. The one showing how pious he is, and the other one is just doing exactly what he's told to do. Because the priest is told to take the host up and bring it right back down. So if you find somebody that does that, it's not because well, he might be an unpious priest, I don't know, but he is doing exactly what he's told to do, whether he knows it or not. That's what the rubric tells you to do. Not to say that a priest who holds the post up for a little bit, that that has become very common and is a very pious thing to do. It's beautiful because we get to see our Lord. Uh, it's, not, it's not that I'm trying to criticize that in any way. Only I'm criticizing our way of judging one between one and the other, if that makes sense. So the criticism is on us, not on the, the good priests who are trying to serve our Lord. The second would be the outward forms of worship, express, so expressions of religion through, through our sentiments. These are exterior, uh, or I'm sorry, interior emotions, like it's the interior being manifest exteriorly. You remember we've talked about that a couple of times. That which is in, inside of us. People will come to me and say, but... You know, good friar, I want to be able to go all the way up in front of the tabernacle and I want to kneel there. Yeah, but why can't you do that at the communion rail? At the communion rail, you can prostrate your soul right in front of the tabernacle. See, we do exteriorly what we feel interiorly, but you can do more interiorly than you can do exteriorly. You can be a complete and utter oblation to God internally, but you can't do that exteriorly because you'll die. Does it make sense? Ostia per ostia is what they say in Italy. It's the um, host for host. The host is a victim. It's a pure oblation, something there's nothing left afterwards. That's what a host is. It's not just a little wafer. We don't mean host for wafer. We mean host for our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity is victim that we get to receive. So we give ourselves as a victim for receiving the victim. Ostia per ostia. So our interior emotion or sentiment gets expressed by our, our, our outward expressions, our bending of our knee, which is an act of adoration, the striking of our breast, which is an external manifestation of internal, hidden uh, pain for our sin. Did you know that? Magnificent to know these things. Now you know when you're striking your breast, you don't have to shake the whole body and have the echo go through the body when you say, mea culpa. 
No, you just that's why the priest will take his hand. I used to criticize this as a master samurai. I said it was it was kind of a sissy thing that the secular priests would take their hand, flat hand, and they would go, Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I just thought it was kind of sissy, so I would tell this to the friars. And then it wasn't until I understood later, it's like, no, I was wrong. You're not supposed you're not taking a fist that isn't better and you're doing this and that, whatever. But you'll have some saints that like would really hit themselves. Saint Pio was known for doing it. It's not to criticize Saint Pio. The saints will have these ins- these deeper inspirations and they'll follow them. But we shouldn't all do them. So we th- everybody thinks we're a saint that has a deeper inspiration. But no, we take our hand and we just say mea culpa, mea culpa. I'm not even striking my breast. I'm making the action showing that I want to reveal the pain that I have in my heart for the hidden sins that have offended our God. I'm showing that externally. And then the raising um, and joining the hands. Like you'll see the priest, sometimes he has to take his hands. You can't really see it when his back's to us, but his hands will go up. The raising of the hands is simply like this. His hands are about like this. He's, he's, he's told to bring his hands out to basically where his shoulders are, the, 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 the bend in his arm, out to there, and no higher than his collarbone. Bring his hands back together and bow there's a couple of different times when he does this during the liturgy. That's a very significant thing. It's, it's a looking up to heaven for the most part. Uh, his hands do one of these. Okay, It's more of a serious kind of... It's more than just doing this when he uh, says oremus. He'll just take his hands apart. This is a different significance. These are showing something in the expression. They're leading him and guiding him into what is supposed to be expressed. What are we following here? Where are we at right now in the liturgy? All the signs of the cross do the same. And the symbolic significance, these are the mysteries of the Christian faith. Mixing of water, these are different things that happen in the liturgy. Washing of the hands, he's not washing his hands. I mean, they're not taking soap up there. There's times where you'll see soap in the liturgy, but that's when, um, you know, the, when he does the ashes. He's got to get ashes off of his hands. And then there's times where he's doing the palms. Well, a bunch of people just kiss his hands. He's going to wash his hands. So when he's doing all this other stuff, before he handles the Holy of Holies, he would wash his hands with soap. But that's before Mass even starts. During Mass, it's a, it's a symbolic washing of the hands. He gets a little bit of water over his fingers, and he, 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 he recites the psalm of uh, lavabo, uh, lavabo, the, the lavabo. Put the hands over the oblation. When we get to that, this, these, these are magnificent things that happen in the liturgy. They've changed from ordinary to extraordinary form. They mean different things now. How that happened, I have no idea. I have some clue, but... Anyways, these are different things that we mean in the symbolic significance. The breaking of the host in the three pieces. Then that third particle, we call it a particle, um, it gets dropped into the chalice. For the, we'll, get, we'll get into that when we get into that. Can't reveal everything. Okay, so now we're, at the, we're, we're on our way to the altar. Ad altare. Uh, to the altar. Now, in going to the altar... This requires first a preparation. Now, this is meant for the priest, but I bring this up because are we not there to assist? And if we're there to assist, how much have we prepared and disposed ourselves? We've talked about this. Remember those graces, the extension and the intensity of the graces and how they apply to us has a lot to do with our ability to to dispose ourselves to receive grace. That's what devotion is and everything else. If you're showing up there just a couple minutes before Mass, talking with everybody downstairs, and then going up, I'm saying this because there's a parish we have where a lot of people do this, but anyways, or, or anything else, talking to people out in the parking lot, and then you just go right in when it's time. There's a reason why most parishes have, thankfully, a rosary before Mass. Or at least, you know, take a good spiritual book, or just kneel in front of our dear blessed Lord, preparing yourself, thinking about the different mysteries that happen at Mass, disposing yourself for those graces that He wants to pour out on you at Mass. This is what a priest needs to do as well before he says Mass. He doesn't just, you know, run doing this and that. Now, sometimes they have to run from the confessional, but because they they feel the duty to make themselves available, the people that travel from long distances, to alleviate themselves of their sins so that they can receive our Lord. It's a sacrifice of the priest. But most likely, he's prepared himself long before going into that confessional for Holy Mass. The procession, there's a difference between low Mass and high Mass. High Mass, um, 
it has obviously more of a solemn form. You're leaving the sacristy, procedamos in pace, and then everybody processes out in their, their particular order, and you go towards the altar. Sometimes you see it with a processional cross. That's really only particular to a pontifical mass, but by custom here in America, most people do it, and it has candles next to it. You have everybody processing forward. At a low mass, the priest just has a beretta on, and he has a chalice. Why would he have the chalice? The, the sacristy is in the exact same. At a high mass, the chalice is already out there. And it's usually, the sacristy is usually by the high altar. Whereas a low mass, you had priests that were walking sometimes long distances. At the Vatican, if you ever go to St. Peter's, you walk. That, that church is enormous. And when you go there early in the morning to have mass said, you can use any of the side altars, which I don't know how many of them there are. They're everywhere. But the priest just brought you down with the pot. you got the missal. You've got the cruets. You've got the, if you're going to say the extraordinary form, you've got the altar cards. And the priest has his chalice. He's got the bread on. And you just walk around until you find an altar that's available. And if there isn't one available, you just keep walking around <laughs> until one becomes available. And he's just got the chalice there because he doesn't know where he's going to go. You can't send somebody out there real quick. It's like a half mile away from the sacristy to the, the altar you're probably going to be at. Set the chalice up. He carries it. They walk in and they set up for Mass. That's why you have him going in, setting Mass up. Normally the altar server had the altar cards and he also had, or if they were already at the altar, he had the missal. What they would do is they would process in. The, the priest would go up to the altar. He'd set up his chalice, bringing out the corporal, setting it on the corporal. While the server takes the missal up and he puts the missal on, lights the candles. Then they both go down to their place and they say, In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. And they start. So the demeanor of the celebrant, he greets no one along the way. This comes from Luke 10.4. When our Lord sent them out two by two, he told them to greet no one. You go where you're supposed to go. That's how important it is, the business that you're on. You're being sent by our Lord. When the priest leaves the sacristy and he's heading to the altar, he's instructed not to greet anyone. He keeps his eyes downcast. And he, he waits till he gets to his altar. He says nothing to no one. Unless he pre- passes another priest who has just got uh, who has just finished saying Mass, they will they will not do each other. But that's it. So the eyes are cast down, very uh, even their stride is one where they're they're looking to get to the altar. It's not a real solemn, slow, drawn out, let's get there. We have we have holy business to, to do. It is covered according to, because of dignity and authority. That's why a priest covers his head. St. Paul says it, it's, it disgraces a man's head to cover his head in church. However, the minister covers his head because he's showing, I have authority here. And I have the dignity given to me. And he comes in with his head covered. So you say, but why the deacon and why the subdeacon? Because they cover their head because they're with the one who has the dignity and authority. They're there to serve him. So because of that, to serve him, they cover their heads. Now, in the ancient church, they covered with a, uh, an amice. They had these amices. They covered their head with They brought it down, kind of like a hood. Religious who have hoods, they put an amice over their hood, and that's what they cover their head with, kind of halfway. Um, and so they don't use berettas, although conventuals use berettas. You'll see St. Maximilian Colby had a beretta because they had these, these kind of tiny hoods that you couldn't use. They were just like decoration hoods. I don't know what they were doing. The bread itself has three points on it, just to let you know. Because you see these things all the time, and you maybe wonder what they mean. The bretta has these, uh, it's a funny looking hat that has these, you know, these, um, these, I don't know what they're called. These, these like little ridges, or I don't know anything about berettas. I don't use them on a lot. I mean, they, they, they got these little corners of these, um, I don't know, these fins or something like that. Well, in, in Italy, to give some background, in Italy, see, they're supposed to have three. Some have four. Like oratorians, I think, can have, oratorians or canons can have four. Normal priests have three. In Italy, priests had three because doctors of the law had four, which is like a secular thing. So doctors of the law had four uh, on all sides, and priests had three in, in, to resent for the Holy Trinity. If they had four, it was a sign of the cross, so in America, we don't follow the Italian tradition. You can have four. Most priests don't know this nowadays because we've lost a lot of this. So most will have three. But in America, the tradition was we had four because of the sign of the cross. 
We didn't have the tradition with secular doctors wearing berettas. Does that make sense? Maybe. A little bit. I don't know how much further we'll get, but we'll, we'll, we'll start into the... So now the... I'm going to jump to the sign of the cross. So we start... Mass with the sign of the cross, and we'll end with this. I might need just a couple extra minutes, just a few, but if you have to go, I understand. So the sign of the cross, from the 8th century on, the sign of the cross changed. We started to use something called a Latin cross. This is what the Latin cross is, so a big cross. The cross before that seems to be they just signed themselves on the forehead. There's different, there's a, in the liturgy we refer to as a Greek cross and a Latin cross. A Greek cross is when we sign ourselves all the way. There's also the Latin cross means one big long bar and then a short bar up top. But that's never made in the liturgy. It, you might find it in churches. You'll find it above the altar. You might find it on the vestments. But when they make the sign of the cross, they're always Greek crosses. That means they have equal uh, sides. Whether it's big or it's small, those are Greek crosses. We say Latin cross because we mean we're signing ourselves with something very large. Okay, that's a Latin cross. But the way it works, it's still a Greek cross. The priest is to put his hand on his, on his basically right here on his, on his, kind of over his stomach. And he makes the sign of the cross with a flat hand from the forehead just to above that hand from shoulder to shoulder. So it makes it a perfect Greek cross, but it's large. So in this regard, we're saying Latin because it's not a sign on the forehead, if that makes sense. That comes to us from about the time of the 8th century. Um, I just explained the Greek versus the Latin. All the signs of the cross over the oblation that the priests make, make have different meanings, and we'll go into all of them, but those are all Greek crosses that are made a certain way. When we make the sign of the cross in the, in the Latin church, we now make it with a flat hand, with a thumb in. We never have things just sitting out here in the air. We have a thumb in, a hand like this, you make the sign of the cross. It was a break, and, and I was just told the other day that some of the Oriental churches broke from each other because they had different ways of making the sign of the cross. <laughs> we used to make the sign of the cross. You'd have kind of like this with the with the two uh, the two natures of our Lord, and then the, you know the one person, and then the, or the Holy Trinity. They had all these different signs. So some people making the sign of the cross like this. Some people making it like this, um, with the three. It gets complicated. It's just a sign of the cross. I'm not sure why they get so complicated about things. But we just do it this way now. That's, that's it. Just a flat hand, we make the sign of the cross. The significance of how to make the sign of the cross. Tertullian, this is a beautiful quote from Tertullian. You know, he messed up in the end, but he had some great stuff to say before that. Every step in coming in and going out, then uh, when putting on our garments and shoes... When washing, when at table, when lighting a candle, or going to bed, when sitting down, or uh, at everyday work we perform, we Christians make uh, mark the forehead with the sign of the cross. Remember, this is in the early 200s, or yeah, early 200s. So they were making the sign of the cross like this. They were signing their forehead, but they made the sign of the cross whenever they did anything, because everything they did was for our Lord and in the sign of the cross. St. Francis de Sales has a beautiful reflection on it, and he, it, it, because of the Holy Trinity. So, in the Holy Trinity, he says, we make the sign of the cross. Because if, if you notice, the Greek Orthodox, they make the sign of the cross to go from the top, the bottom, from the uh, right to the left. We go from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right. We didn't always do it that way. There was a time in the church where we went from the right to the left. Probably even at the time of St. Francis, we were going from, they say under Innocent the uh, Third, which was the time of St. Francis, Counts, Fourth Council of Lateran, Lateran Council, they would go from the, from the head to the um, top to bottom, and then from the, right, or from the right to the left. We now do it differently, and St. Francis de Sales gives a beautiful reflection on it, because the Father uh, is the Godhead, and the Son, the, the Son is begotten by the Father, who descends into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the Holy Ghost is the love between the Father and the Son. It is sent by them both, and He unites them. 
Now it also reveals to us, so it's a brief declaration of our faith in the three great mysteries by which we pass from the left to the right. So the three great mysteries are that we, the Holy Trinity. So we've already seen the Holy Trinity in the sign of the cross, the passion and death of our Lord. The cross reminds us of the passion and death of our Lord. And then it also reminds us that we have, our sins have been forgiven or the forgiveness, the doctrine of the forgiveness of sins. So these three things. And so by going from the left to the right, it shows we're passing from the cursed to the redeemed, to the blessed, as our Lord called them. Beautiful reflection. So when you're making it, the, the sign of the cross is never to be made by us Christians uh, as just flotting, flotting swaths, flotting, swatting, swatting flies, swatting flies. It should just be swatting flies. We, we very intentionally should be making a prayer to the Holy Trinity, thinking about the things that were redeemed, you know, the, the mysteries of our faith, and remembering that because of these three things, we're passing from the damned to, to the redeemed. Now, why that? Because the priest, when he arrives at the altar, he's faced with something very, very grave. He's faced with the fact that he's being called to ascend up to the Holy of Holies and stand before Almighty God, doing the purest of all acts that can be can be offered on this on this life. He's being called to do that, and to be called to do something like that would mean to be called to a life of extreme purity. But even even priests are of of the same fickle nature that that we are, and so he must stand there and tremble, realizing what a dignity he's been given. And how little he's cooperated with that dignity in face to face with the reality of what he now has to do. So realizing that he now faces, he stands before God in duty and in vocation and in desire to give the glory that God asks to obtain the graces that that the church militant require and to afford the blood shed by our Lord for the thirsty souls of purgatory, he proceeds forward almost as a victim for us to offer himself to the victim of victims. And the only way you can face something so so great is he makes the first thing he does is he makes the sign of the cross. Magnificent, huh? He stands there before the magnitude of his duty and his office and his vocation And wrapped in charity, which is the vestments, remember? Wrapped in charity, he proceeds forward with the sign of the cross. And we'll stop there. That's what what leads us into the psalm. And the church synthesizing to this moment of perfection. Why Psalm 42? Why this psalm of King David? This was a psalm of King David when he was fleeing Jerusalem. He had to leave the Holy of Holies behind. His son Absalom was chasing him. They were throwing rocks at him on that on the mountain, cursing him. And he said, no, let them do it. The Lord has permitted it. This is a song that David sings. It's a psalm of petition to our Lord. And it's a psalm of a heart that's rended, but has great joy because he trusts completely in a good God who will give back everything he needs. And he knows it. And so the priest goes, makes the sign of the cross and recites this psalm. You'll notice in Passion Tide right now, which we're in, they don't say this psalm because it's a psalm of joy and we're entering into the Passion. As we enter into the Passion, there is not this psalm of joy. When, we, when we're at a Mass for the dead, uh, a funeral Mass or a requiem Mass, there is not this psalm of joy. It's taken out. Other rites, like the Carthusians, I don't believe they ever have this psalm because they never have that element of that joy uh, at the very beginning. But it is also because of this psalm of joy, this ad altare day, this going to the altar as the, the joy of our youth is what it says in there. Three different times, I believe, as the joy of our youth to go to the altar of God. In doing that, <clears throat> it's, mother, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the maternity of the church that gives us the comfort to approach our Lord at the altar 
and to receive the gifts that we need to receive from Him. So it gives us that courage and that joy and that assurity of what God wants to give us, though we fall short constantly and it's almost shameful that we present ourselves over and over again. But that's the, the loving mother of the church gives us this psalm to encourage us to keep going forward. So, any questions? Yeah? Well, mass is, so the question is, what, ask, so what, what does it mean about mass being offered at somebody's house, or what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, your, your uh, perspective. Okay, so my perspective on whether mass can be offered at somebody's house. If churches were built so they could have altars. Altars are there so you can have mass. Mass is the holiest thing ever, and it's supposed to be said in a place dedicated only for that. Mass is for church, or the church is for the mass. Uh, it's, not, it's not to be said in people's houses. However, permissions can be given. In fact, any time Mass is to be said outside of a church, permission is supposed to, I don't know about in the new, I think it's still in there, but Mass is, you're supposed to get permission from the ordinary. So people like climbing mountains now, and they love saying Mass on top of mountains. It's all about, there's so much novelty nowadays. We're so attracted to novelty. We want to go somewhere and just do something outside and make it unique so we have Mass outside. But, and maybe that could be necessary at some different times. But to do that, uh, what's needed is permission of the ordinary of that place. Because if you're going to have Mass outside, you need to also make sure that you're going to be able to do it without you know, something bad happening. You know, you're gonna, are you going to have a level area? We know in the, when the, uh, the people in Ireland, when they were being persecuted, they had to have Mass outside because they were persecuted. So, but they carved an altar out of a big rock. It's called the Mass Rocks. There's Mass Rocks in the Glen. It's a beautiful hymn. If you want to look it up, you can find it on YouTube. It's an, it's an ancient folk song that describes what they were doing. It's beautiful. And they talk about, it's called Mass Rock in the Glen. And it was a time of the persecution. You can still go there. I've never seen one, but you can, you can, they would carve an altar out of these rocks. And all the faith would go there on Sunday, and they would participate in the Old Mass. Meaning, not the Mass that they had established, the heretics that had come in and tried to and strip them of their faith. And I don't remember how long they had to do that, but I'm sure there's literature on it if you're interested in it. It's a beautiful tradition that they have. They even have paintings still. It's still very much a part of their tradition. But Mass, like in somebody's bedroom, it could be possible. Sometimes you have these people that are stigmatists and you have history of that. They get permission. You could have Mass there. People that were bedridden, whatever. But uh, profane places, you're not supposed to have sacred things. And so... Permission needs to be sought. There are regulations for this in canon law, but I don't... What's that? Well, liturgically, there almost is no formation. But liturgically, the things that I'm telling you is what a seminarian should probably be learning, a lot more than this, but should be learning in seminary. But now, the seminarian formation, I had one of the leading liturgists, we had a book from him, his name was A. Rouget, and, and I hated it. Uh, I, I just read other books during the class and didn't pay any attention to what he was saying because all they do is say, on this day we read this lesson and this lesson and then we sing that song. Why do you do that? Nobody tells you why. It's just because they said, on this day, that's what we're going to do. And that was what the whole liturgical course was. So in the end, what do you know about liturgy? Nothing. Because liturgy itself was one of the theological disciplines. It's a theological discipline. So that's why you had it in liturgy. That means there's a science to it on the way you go about it, how you do it, how you study it, how, all that. There's terms, there's, there, there's a foundation that has to be built. But if you don't have any of that, well, it's easy to change liturgy because nobody knows what it is. Pastoral reasons then become the guiding force. And that's what we have. We have a term called pastoral. We don't even know what it means. And it guides what we do. Now, so you can change something because you say pastorally, it's it's good to play soccer with kids at mass. That happened. You know, it's happened a couple different times. But when the priest had a soccer mass uh, not too long ago, uh, that that he was suspended for a short time. But the the explanation by the by the bishop was, but I can't I can't uh, I can't fault him on his pastorality. What do you mean? See, it just doesn't make any sense. What what does that term mean? So. 
Any other questions? Yeah? So, so when, uh, I'm trying to study this. So when Quo Primum was published, it allowed a lot of math, how, and it said you couldn't change it. So when they came with all these, it sounded like reading history that every time they made a small change, like added a feast day or something, they would still always quote Quo Primum and say, hey, we, we're not really changing the liturgy, we're just adding a feast day. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they changed yeah. everything. So it, how did they get around? Well, first point, the first point is, you're right, the only changes that ever happened, now we have three different uh, missile changes. I didn't talk about it. I thought I had it in here somewhere. But you had, oh, I might have had it, I just didn't address it, but you, you had um, Clement, I think the eighth, he made a change to the missile, but it was only because those who were printing the missile started making a uh, uh, I forget the word, like typo. Anyways, um, they were errors from the printing. And they went in to correct that. But just because they had made, you think, why, why would you even worry about that? That's how, that's how serious they took the liturgy. And I think he said something like, I don't have the quote anymore, but he said something like, woe is me that, that anybody would think I dare touch God's work or something like that. And all he was doing was correcting things that had come in because of bad printing. So they, they corrected that. And then you had Urban VIII. He came in and had to make a couple of corrections. But it had more to do with, I can't remember exactly, but it didn't affect it either. So what happened over the years, you only had liturgical feasts coming in and out. Uh, but you never had new prefaces. You never had new prayers. You never had things change. Nothing changed. You didn't change it. Except liturgical feasts, which had to do with the piety of the people and the changing the time, that kind of thing. Until just recently when they changed everything. And that's just it. We don't know. I mean, we don't know what it meant to change everything like that and start a new missile. So they didn't change that missile. They started a new one. Oh, so that's how they got around the cool premium. They just said yeah. this is a new missile. You have to understand that the only reason we can have two missiles right now is because one stopped and another one started. So now you have two missiles. And thanks be to God it did because it left it left the mass that goes all the way back to who we don't even know when still there in its, in its essentials. Then we have a new missile that came up for a pastoral reason. But we do know that pastoral reasons pass. And the reason for the thing for that pastoral moment passes as well. So is this something that will be continue to be established? The main question that we have now from quote uh, primum is whether or not it was you're allowed to abrogate this missile and whether or not you're allowed to tell any priest he's not allowed to say it because there are people right now that are being told they can't say it and they were told that for a long time. Are you allowed to do that? Yes or no? Some people say you are because the supreme authority who wrote that document is a supreme authority who is now saying you can't do this. And that seems to, I mean, a lot of canon lawyers seem to say that's valid. I mean, supreme authority can change. He had that supreme authority at that point in time for that moment, and now at this moment he has a different moment. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on that topic, and I don't know. Um, it's just a mystery. Um, Mysterium iniquitatis, we would say. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure. At least with the, with the two forms that we have now, we're dealing with two different missiles. Essentially, the break with tradition happened first with Holy Week, and then it happened now that we have a whole new missile. So essentially we have two different forms of the one Roman rite, is the way Pope Benedict had to say it. Any other questions? All right. So we'll just say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. The Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Actionus nostras quesimus, Domini, speranda proveni, tiuvando prosequere, cunto non nostro operatio, te semper incipiat per accepta finiatur. Per Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen.
Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so now we're, we're getting into the Mass, finally. So, can you, is, it, is the microphone on? So now we're entering the Mass. Last week we talked a little bit about um, prepper. Well, what we talked about was um, we started to move in. There it goes. It was, it was in the back. So. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, there's a buzz, but I don't know about microphones and things. <laughs> So we started to talk about the, the, the foot of the altar prayers. So instead of going back and talking about that again, um, what, we need, what we need to address is what does it look like walking into Mass when, when Mass first starts? So we have preparation prayers, but instead of talking about the preparation prayers right away, first we have to talk about the introit. Now the introit, uh, the way the way the mass is set today, the first thing in the missal when the per, when the priest starts the mass, he has he has the um, he has the introit when he makes the sign of the cross. But the, we have the preparation prayers, the the introit, then we have incense, Gloria, and the collect. The collect's the first prayer that's said. So these are the things that we want to talk about today. However, it's in a, it's in a different order. And also because the Mass is 2,000 years old, you, you have things that take place in different times that only got set into the place where they are right now uh, at, a later, at a later time. Yeah, okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So though it's preparation prayers, obviously, is what you've got to say before you start Mass, the intro is the first thing we want to talk about. Because the intro was always a processional hymn. Now, we hate hearing that nowadays because when in the new Mass, we do all these hymns that are, that are very difficult to listen to, and we'll talk about that too. But the idea of these difficult hymns is because we needed to sing something, some processional song, uh, so we're singing something. But from the earliest date, we had these processional songs, and mostly because you don't have a procession where there's no music. You can imagine if you have people processing in silence, you know it's because there's something grave that just happened or something very somber is going on, but it's not something joyful that's happening. <clears throat> in fact, right now, as we're entering the Passion Tide, or we're in Passion Tide and we're in, we're in uh, Holy Week, we're entering in the Triduum, uh, we even just saw it on um, Palm Sunday. We're walking out of the church and there's no organ, there's no singing, there's nothing. You're just walking out and there's just dead silence. On Friday, Good Friday, it's the same thing. You know something very grave just happened. You, you leave there almost depressed. No music. So the hymn is something to try to help with that. But we have to see what kind of hymns were these. In early, the early Christian hymn book, was it wasn't Here I Am, Lord, by, I forget his name, and, and all these other strange hymns that we have nowadays, mostly Protestant. We have a lot of Protestant hymns that we love. We love these Protestant hymns. But the early hymn book was, it was the Psalter. It was 150 psalms. And it was so much so that, it, that I've mentioned this before, but at the, at the height of the Christianitas, like the time of St. Francis, the, the, the people, they knew the psalms by heart. You didn't, I mean, at least most of them. So the early Christian hymn book was the psalms. That's what, that's what we Christians sang. So how does that start to work into the liturgy? Well, you start seeing, well, there's this procession. Well, I mean, maybe there wasn't always a procession, and there didn't have to be a procession. But if you look at St. John Lateran Church, the Pope is, is riding on horseback there from somewhere, and then they're setting up in the in, um, secretarium. It's a different room somewhere where they would get prepared, get vested and everything. And then they have a procession from there. So it's a procession just to the church. And they have a procession from that part of the church to the main part. Well, these are massive churches. And you, want, you don't want to just be walking there with nothing going on. So the, the, the Christians would sing hymns. And the hymns that were written by, by God's prophets, the, the Psalms. 
the first time we really start to see the, this, this, the introduction of these psalms, at least into the liturgy, is Pope um, Celestine I. That's 422 to 432. And we have that written in the Liber Pontificalis. And then we also have it written, it grows from there. So we have an introduction of psalms being said. Then you have Pope Gregory. He introduces antiphons with it. We know what an antiphon is. It's just a, like a little scripture passage or something. It's a verse that goes, and then you sing the psalm, and then you have the verse, uh, this little verse, this antiphon again. He introduces these, and he writes them out. Uh, Pope Gelesius I, remember he has his own... Uh, Anyways, the, the, one of the, the Gelesian uh, Sacramentarium, it comes from him as well. One of these books where he, he had, we have things that come from him on um, developments in the liturgy. But we see that he's the first one to really start developing an introit, an introit where we have this entrance hymn. But now we're referring to it as an entrance hymn, but this is the first part of the Mass that, that's happening as well. And then we have something called a double doxology. That's the Gloria Patri, so the double doxology. When we ever say doxology, we're talking about this. Uh, um, it's, a, it, 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 it's addressed to, it's a praise dressed, addressed to the, the, the Holy Trinity. So glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy, Go- Holy Ghost, uh, as it was in the beginning. Second part, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. And that comes from at least 435. Now, we want to understand, see, what we have in, the, in our Mass today, I have to speak about the old Mass, because really in the new Mass, though there is an introit, these things don't make any sense in the new Mass, because you don't really use them. You sing something by some modern author, or something even worse, written by Luther himself, or Calvin, or some other Protestant, and that's our in, intro, that, that's, that, that's what we're, we're processing into so really, the, this format that comes down to us from the very earliest times, having an introit and some of these other psalms that are inside the liturgy, built in liturgical hymns into the liturgy, they've, they've pretty much been abandoned. Only in those churches where somebody's really trying really hard and they've got somebody that can read Latin and has some musical background, really a lot of music backgrounds, they have to be very creative, they're able to do some of this sacred music in the new Mass but it really, it's kind of difficult. And in fact, what happens in the new Mass is when you have sacred music, I know this sounds strange, but I've been a part of this for a long time. When you have sacred music in the new Mass, the sacred music dominates the Mass. Whereas music itself in the liturgy is only an accompaniment to the liturgy. This is the problem. Music, it, there was a, uh, it was written by pa, it was Pope, uh, Pope St. Pius X. He wrote um um, his his juris, this uh, like basically canon law as they call it for a law for music. It was a motu proprio on music, and he says that music is never to dominate uh, the liturgy. That the the ministers of the mass never wait on the music. In the new mass, the ministers are always waiting on the music because the music's in charge. If you have a sacred music program, and even if you don't, you'll be singing. You know, the, the, the here I am, Lord. You have a couple of examples here. You know that they're in the next slide. You sing some of these these hymns that were just made in the '70s that have nothing to do with anything. In fact, might even be a bit heretical. In most cases, they are a bit heretical in the sense of where they lead our faith, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. Uh, the, the celebrant has to sit and wait for these songs to be finished. That was, that was condemned by St. Pope Pius IX. He said, absolutely in no way. I was corrected by a cardinal once during a pontifical mass in the old rite, but the choir, we were still new at this stuff, and the choir started singing a beautiful hymn, the uh, Magnificat at the end, but he had to give the indulgence. There's a certain indulgence that you can give, a blessing at the very end of mass, but before the final gospel, or final, I forget exactly, but they started singing this very complicated Magnificat, and I looked at the cardinal and I said, what do you want me to do? And he cited to me the law of Pius X right there on the spot, and he just said, the celebrant must never, he must never wait on the music. And so I just turned, I was like, quiet, quiet, quiet. I mean, the cardinal knew exactly what to do. It was fantastic. He's now deceased. It was Cardinal Oyos. He used to be in charge of Ecclesia Day and everything. Wonderful Brazilian bishop, uh, cardinal. Um, 
But now, it, it, essentially, that's the way it is now in the, in the new Mass. It, the, the celebrant and everybody waits on the music because the music dominates. In fact, when, they started having the, when, when we started having the old Mass and the new Mass um, kind of side by side, and the, new, the old Mass was still kind of new, what happened was uh, there was constant tension between the choir and those who were leading the liturgy because the choir itself thought that they were in charge. And those who are leading the liturgy are actually in charge, and so it became it became difficult. I'll, I'll, right, right when we get done, I'll, so make, make sure you remember. I'll, I'll answer your questions when we get done with the, the first the first segment. Um. So the antiphon, this this way. So in the liturgy, what we have is the introit, where it's said in the mass, where it actually shows up in the missal. You just have a section of an antiphon. Uh, or sorry, you have an antiphon, then you have a section of a psalm, and then you have the antiphon repeated, and then you have that double doxology, that glory be, and then you go back up and you say part of that, that psalm again. Uh, we'll show kind of some of that development. But where does that come from? It comes from St. Ambrose. It comes out of Antioch, this, these antiphons, and this, this way of singing psalms, and it says answering with voice, because what we have even today in, um, in the, the divine office there's this first psalm that has to be said before you start saying all the other psalms of Matins, and it's called the Invitatory Prayer. It's Psalm uh, 90, wait a minute, I have it written down, 94. Psalm 94. And the way that's broken up, it's a throwback to the way they used to do psalms in the Roman Rite that we even received from Antioch. What you have is each psalm has, you, you know, it's got like two verses to it or four lines, and then you have your antiphon. You start it with, you say your antiphon, and then after that, um, you have a verse from the psalm. Then you repeat the antiphon. Then you have another, another verse from the psalm. Then you repeat it, the antiphon again. And you keep doing that all the way through the psalm. That's how the Roman way and what we received from Antioch was the way that we sang the psalms. That's why it says answering with voice, antiphon, answering with voice. Of course, it's a Greek word. So you have the antiphon that gets said. And then we sing the psalm, antiphon psalm. This actually sets up, see, if most of the people in Christendom knew the Psalms by heart, and they did, but they were singing them because they sang everything back then, there had to be, there were different tones that were used. So there had to be a way to set the tone so they knew how to sing the, 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 the Psalm. Well, that's what the antiphon did. The antiphon, even today when we sing Vespers or anything else, the, the antiphon itself sets up the tone for the psalm that we're getting ready to sing. So naturally, if somebody intones this, the antiphon, you already know how you're going to be singing the, um, the psalm itself. And this comes from way back, uh, comes to us from Antioch. And, and St. Ambrose, at least by the authority of St. Augustine, who writes in the Confessions, and I have it cited here, Confessions chapter 9, uh, he says that Ambrose, St. Ambrose, is the one that brought that to the, to the Western Church. So the antiphon, anyway, I just, I just covered that one, sorry. Hymns in Catholic worship, are they filler? Are they for participation? What do we have them for? Now, everything we've led up to until now has to do with glory and honor of God. That's why we have Catholic worship, glory and honor of God. But what do the hymns have to do with anything that we sing, for example, at the New Mass? Where you got some lady belting out a, a number in the book. Everybody has to open the book, and they all have to belt out with her some hymn. And I was, I was just at a church the other day, and they started singing Amazing Grace. I was blown away. I didn't realize people still sang Amazing Grace. Because Amazing Grace is a Protestant hymn. And so I looked it up online today, looking at some blogs where people are, it's like Catholic Answers, I think, and they're talking about Amazing Grace. It's the blog portion of it where people are writing back and forth and talking about Amazing Grace. And, and one, one guy from a choir, a choir director, someone's asking, is it okay to use Amazing Grace? Is this a Catholic hymn? And other people say, no, it's a Protestant hymn, but it's a good Protestant hymn. And, and so, but nobody had any solid information. They're all just kind of saying, you shouldn't use it because it's not Catholic, but and that's the only reason why. And so in the end, he comes back and says, listen, just because you say I shouldn't use it because it's not Catholic, but you can't give me any other reason why, he's like, that's the first hymn I'm going to sing this Sunday. He's like, you, you guys, you, you've, lost, you've lost contact with, with why we're even at Mass. 
And that's a big problem. The lex, lex orandi, lex credendi. The way we pray is the way we believe. And so after a while, we start singing Amazing Grace, which essentially, here's the verse that, that gets me. Amazing Grace, how sweet thou art. Oh, sorry, I've got that backwards. Who saved a wretch like me? Now, wretch like me, we know what Protestants think about wretch. We can call ourselves wretches because what we mean is because we sin and because we, we don't live up to the dignity that, that God has elevated us to through sa- sanctifying grace. Or sometimes we lose that grace through grave acts against God. But we're not wretched. Internally, we're not wretched and corrupt. And that's what Protestants believe. They believe that you're internally wretched and corrupt. And our salvation is, a sub- is an objective salvation that God or Christ redeems us, wraps us in his justification and sneaks us into heaven, though we are wretched. So essentially making heaven hell because you have wretched, corrupt creatures there that God just pretends they're not corrupt and wretched. But we don't believe that. We believe that God actually makes us perfect and makes us like him. And by getting to the beatific vision only means we have arrived at perfection. So it's complete opposite of what Protestants believe. And you have to believe that if you're a Protestant because that's what Luther had to do to ease his conscience because he still wanted to sin and he wanted to sin um, wholeheartedly but believe even more wholeheartedly. Then there's another strange hymn that Mary, did, did you know? You hear that at Christmas time. It's a nice hymn. Oh, it's very nice. Asking the question over and over again, Mary, did you know? She, she is the Immaculate Conception. I mean, for us Catholics to sit around asking if the Blessed Virgin knew that her son, she knew she was a virgin, and she knew that God talked to her, and she knew who Jesus was supposed to be, and she... And then we sit around singing and say, but it's just nice. What it has to do with is our liturgy has has bowed down to sentimentalism. We like it because it it gets me inside. I I, I like when I, oh, amazing grace, how sweet thou art who saved a wretch like me. I I can feel that inside. Oh, Mary, did you know? And it's just, it's the music itself that's very, it's very sentimental and sappy. So it touches kind of a, a lower chord in our faculties, a very sentimental, effeminate chord. Um, and then there's a couple others that I got from uh, George Weigel. He wrote an article, and it was actually quite good. Be Not Afraid, he he talks about Be Not Afraid. The other one, uh, You Are Mine. Um, and then I Am the Bread of Life. He calls this the I Am Jesus hymns. What he means is, in all these hymns, we're taking some phrase from Scripture and then we're applying it to ourselves and we're saying it over and over and over again. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And you keep saying it over and over again. Um, but these, these, these become a problem because it turns away from us giving praise to God. Instead, we're saying something in the first person, um, essentially, that we're making ourselves that thing. He explains it. I sh- I should have put the link in here for for you to find that yourself, but you can type that in. George White, he wrote, he wrote a nice article. on. So what what are the hymns? They're not just filler. They were the Psalms. They were the Psalms. It was the perfect praise of God uh, enshrined in scriptures, and we would pray those things to get us to the altar. And they weren't for filling dead space. They, they were just, there was space there, so we fill it with perfect praise. The introit is a variable variable part of the Mass. That means every Mass has a different introit. Although some Masses, like a Mass of a Martyr, could have the same introit every time. A Mass of Our Lady could have the same introit every time. But it means that every day you don't have the same fixed prayer, like the canons of fixed prayer. The introit is what gives the name to the Mass. So you'd say, mm, um, I wrote a couple here, like Requiem, the Requiem Mass, that comes from the Antiphon. Uh, Salve Sante Parens. That, that's a mass that, that comes from, um, these are scriptural. So sometimes you have things that come from the Bible. Sometimes they come antiphons from uh, the Psalms. Sometimes they come from ecclesiastical writings, meaning it was a part of a mass written by some, some saint or some, some religious or somebody for the church, not a committee. They didn't have committees way back then. These writings came from, from deep Catholic piety. And then some masses have, have none since you're already at the altar. Some masses don't have an introit. For example, this Holy Saturday, there is no introit. So Holy Saturday, you're doing a, uh, the vigil mass, you're doing all kinds of stuff. 
you're, you're, you're doing the baptismal font, then you process back and you have a, uh, a litany, then after the litany you have this the Kyrie eleison, and you're starting Mass already at the Kyrie eleison. You're actually processing in right when the Agnus Dei is being said from the litany, and then once they get to the uh, Kyrie eleison, you're at the foot of the altar saying the foot of the altar prayers. <clears throat> so there's no introit. Same thing for uh, Whit Sunday, that is the eve of Pentecost. The same thing there, because you basically have a repeat of uh, Holy Saturday. It's almost the exact same liturgy. So there, you're, you're already there at the altar. There's no introit. That's where Holy Week and some of these liturgies, we see remnants there are the archaic liturgy itself preserved. Because Holy Week was so sacred, you never touched it, you never reformed it, you never messed with it until we have we were so bold to do it in fifty in 1955. But before that, it was untouchable. So in that, what we still find today, well, at least in the pre-55 liturgy, you find all kinds of um, remnants of the archaic past that we can't find out, we don't know where they started at. And so the litany we'll talk about when we get to the Kyrie eleison. So the celebrant's preparatory prayers, that is what we do today at the foot of the altar, that's what happens, those are the preparatory prayers for the priest, they finally found their way to the foot of the altar, whereas before, during the entrance hymn, the introit, he would say say Psalm 42 under his breath, or out loud, some places said that um, they were said in private, or they were said aloud before, uh, before getting to the altar. Uh, there were other ways in different places of saying preparatory prayer. Some had the Veni Creator when he was putting on vestments. Now the priest says a prayer for each vestment that he puts on. But just to show, it hasn't always consistently been that across the board. There have been different ways to do preparatory prayers. Now they're fixed at the foot of the altar, which means the priest really has to prepare before Mass even, even earlier. But the liturgical preparation is the foot of the altar prayers. So, for the new mass, they're not there. Um, there, there. There's liturgies that have been, are part of the liturgy has been put into the mass. That is, the confidior now is inside the mass. It's a shortened version where, um, when we confess our sins at mass, which is in keeping with with ancient tradition, meaning that before mass, but mass has already started, so. It, it's a, it's a bit, I don't know, I'm not sure what to say about it. But So, the foot of the altar prayers is the newest part of the Mass. There's no mention of it before uh, the turn of the first century. After that, we start seeing this, this development. And I think the reason why we're seeing it now is because you already had these preparatory prayers going on, but they were things that were going on in different dioceses in different ways. And then they start to synthesize this through a deep Catholic piety, and it starts to manifest itself, in, especially in Psalm 42, in the antiphon before it, uh, in the Deus in Auditorium Meum Intende, which comes before you're going to say the Confidior. And there's the same thing which we see in the office today. In the office today, that, that's the Psalms that the, the priests and religious pray, you have a, an hour in the old breviary, it's called Sext, and then you have Compline. There's a confidior in, in those, at least in, in Compline there's the confidior. But before you get to certain points, there's the Deus in Auditorium Mam and Tende. You're always calling on, on, on the help of the Lord. Let's see. I have the, uh, this pontifical kiss. I think I might wait and talk about that later. Well, I'll just I'll, I'll probably mention it in both places. I don't want to forget it. But what I have written here at the bottom is the pontifical kissing the gospel and the altar. So what, what it means is there's a difference between a pontifical mass and a solemn high mass of a priest and a low mass. Low mass really comes from the High Mass. But High Mass doesn't necessarily come from the Pontifical Mass. The Pontifical Mass is much different, though. Uh, in a Pontifical Mass, the subdeacon carries in a maniple. 
And he carries it in, well, it's really probably in the gospel, but in, in older, older liturgies, he carried it in his hand. So what's happening here is when you have a pontifical mass and you're processing to the altar, the deacon has the gospel, the evangeliarium, and he's got a maniple marking where the gospel is. The maniple stuck inside the book, and he carries that with the maniple sitting there. We still do it today in the old pontifical masses for the extraordinary form. You carry that in. When you get to the altar, you have... Um, you do the foot of the altar prayers. The bishop doesn't have his maniple on. When he gets done with the confidier, the subdeacon rises. He takes the maniple, he kisses it, and then he puts it on the celebrant's arm. <clears throat> then the celebrant goes up to the top of the altar, and the master ceremony holds open the book, and the deacon points, and then the celebrant kisses first the gospel, which, which will be read, and then he kisses the altar and then Mass goes from there, going to the introit. And, well, then, no, then they have the insensation of the altar, which takes us to the insensation of the altar. So after these prayers, remember these prayers at the foot of the altar, these preparatory prayers, as we talked about last week, and we talked about the sign of the cross last week and how important it was, it's because now we stand there before the altar and get preparing to do something that is beyond the worthiness of men. And so man girds himself. We know what girding means, right? To gird your loins. Sounds almost strange saying gird your loins. But girding your loins, I don't know if anybody knows what that is. So it's it's basically just taking this, the sides of your garment. The garment would have normally gone straight to the ground. They weren't dressed much different than I am. And it would have gone to the ground, though. So if you're going walking somewhere, you would take the sides, you'd lift them up, and you'd have something around their waist and you would take it up through here the cincher and you'd tuck it down in there and that hoists everything up so you can freely walk that's what girding your loins is going into battle was even different you gird it up in a different way it kind of almost became like a big diaper then you could just run at people and you didn't have any hindrance at all with because they weren't wearing they weren't wearing um pants or as they say in england trousers pants in england is offensive to say so you have to Anyways, so they would gird their loins. In a way, we say that because you're getting ready to go into battle. You're getting ready to do something. Gird your loins. It's um, so we make that reference. We gird our loins. Basically, when we're making the sign of the cross, we're 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 using it as our strength, uh, as we talked about last week. Before we go up into this uh, to to do this this great and holy thing. So the first thing that happens when they go up. They've, sung, they've said the foot of the altar prayers. The priest goes up and he kisses the altar. But why is he kissing the altar? He kisses the altar because it's the sign of Christ. But there's a rock in the center of the altar, which is the sign of Christ, and where the relic is that's buried there of the martyr saint that's in that, usually martyr saint, but a saint in, in that altar. And he kisses, he kisses that saying prayers while he's going up to kiss that, that relic. And then they incense the altar, but why do they incense the altar? Now here is another very interesting, I don't know if people have a, a complete take on why we're using incense in the liturgy, but there seems to be consistency in understanding why. Um, I, Fortescue has a really good take on it, because he, Fortescue, Adrian Fortescue, as we talked about, he really sees the Roman liturgy in a very practical way. And what he says is incense itself. Now, we know in sacred scriptures, incense was used for a few different things. First off, incense is holy to the Lord. Thou shalt make, it says in Exodus, thou shalt make also an altar to burn incense of setim wood. Now, most incense was, 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 was uh, produced from a certain tree in Africa. It doesn't, I checked to see if it could grow here. They said it can grow in I think in Arizona, but with a lot of difficulty. So it's a particular tree there, and what happens is the the sap that oozes from it, you scrape that off, you let it dry, and you scrape that off, and you get incense from it. It's supposed to be magnificent smell. But it's very difficult to produce, and so it's a very rich commodity. And this is what the the Magi brought in adoration of our dear blessed Lord. So they, they, bring, they bring this as an act of adoration. So we see through scripture, these different things. Also, offering incense uh, to... So, I just 
to read this quickly. So from Apocalypse 8, 3, And another angel came and stood before the altar, having a golden um, censer, and there was given to him much incense, that he should offer of the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne of God. So we know that incense is very important in the worship of God, in the service of God, and it has different significance. But when did it work its way into the liturgy itself? We know the Jews had to go in at the, t- at the hour of the uh, hour of sacrifice, and the sacrifice that they were doing was on an altar that was before the Holy of Holies. So you had the, bef- I think you had the veil there, the Holy of Holies, and outside of that, so before you used the, the veil, there was an altar there where you burned incense, and you did that once a day at the, at the hour of prayer. That's where uh, Zechariah was when the angel Gabriel appeared to him. He was offering the hour of incense. He was offering the incense on the altar. So we, we know this is important to our Lord uh, liturgically, but in the Christian cult, when do we start to use it? It seems that pagans always used it. They always burnt incense, and we know that because we were told, we Christians were told we had to burn incense even to the effigy of the, either the Roman gods or to the emperor himself who made himself a god. And if you didn't do it, then you had, you had to die. One grain of incense for your life. I like to ask kids nowadays because a lot of times we easily will say, um, yeah, I would never do that. You know, the Christians, they had to, they had to you know, not burn the incense, whatever. But let's think about it on our, our part. If all I had to do, everybody knows that Obama wasn't God. But if during the Obama uh, presidency, all Catholics had to go and burn a grain of incense before Obama, or they'd take all of your property and then they'd kill you. Um, how many Catholics would just just say, well, I mean, I don't mean it. It's just one grain of incense. I know he's not God. Everybody knows he's not God. How many Catholics would actually probably lose their life? I fear to say very few would probably lose their life. Because think about like Sunday. We're not supposed to work on Sunday. But you know everybody has an excuse for why they can work on Sunday now, right? We all have the excuse. So in the end, we'd have an excuse for that too. There's... I mean, we we justify these things away. God really doesn't want us to lose our life just over this. Everybody knows Obama's not the not God, so why would we have to drop a gold incense? I just I'll let them take my hand and drop it there, and uh, then I'll, I'll confess it later. This is kind of the new Catholic way of thinking. We have an idea in our head that we would never do that, but then if it came down to it, what would we actually do? It's a simple little thing, and they willingly threw themselves into fires and ran towards lions rather than drop a grain of incense on a fire to somebody that everybody knew wasn't a god. But incense itself was also used, other than the worship of pagans, it was used for um, to show reverence towards a particular individual. So if you had a, like a, I don't know if they were for senators, or, but some, some important person, they would burn incense before that person or in that person's presence, not towards that person, Probably because people didn't smell so great all the time. I mean, they had during the during the the, the uh, stations they call them the the stations in Rome where you'd go from one church to another. when they'd have these certain liturgies. It's a it's a common Roman practice. You take a certain tree, all of its leaves, and you throw it all over the ground because you're going to have all these people pack it into the church that day. So as they're walking all over the church, they're walking all over these these leaves, and the leaves all get broken up, and they send a nice smell into the air. <laughs> Well, they weren't doing that because they they're doing that because it didn't smell so nice in the church when you had everybody packed in there. Maybe it could have been that, I don't know. But the point is, when these people would process somewhere, they'd go somewhere, they're in meetings somewhere, they're, they would burn incense, and there, it was a sign that they were an important person. But it wasn't offered to them. So if they did that for their important people, what about a bishop? And so the bishops, they started to burn incense. When the bishop would process from one place to the next, you'd have the thoroughfare would have the incense would burn in his presence. When he would be sitting on his throne uh, during the mass or some liturgy, there'd be somebody there holding the incense. At that point in time, it was just a symbol of he's important. If the pagans have their important people who you burn incense because of a cultural thing, well, we have our important people, so we burn our incense. It's kind of the same thing with the maniple. The important people held a maniple in their hands, so... The, the, the clergy started to wear the maniple in their hand first and then over their arm. 
Well, if you can hold incense at the throne of the bishop and walk in front of the bishop during procession, well, how much more the throne of God at the altar and during, during his holy liturgy? And so the, so the incense started to get moved to the altar. Now, this moment when we walk into the liturgy, remember, we're talking about mass in its solemn form. We come in, we say the, the prayer, prayer is at the foot of the altar. Very first thing we do, we incense the altar as an act of reverence. And that's it. For the most part, that's it. It's also an act of sanctification. It's an act of, you know, it's a solemn moment also to help dispose us because you see this, this plumes of smoke that, that mystically enshroud everything, which also are symbols of our prayers rising up to God. There's all kinds of symbolism we can put into it. But essentially, it comes from a practical aspect of we need to show that this altar, we're, we're offering it reverence as we offer the bishop reverence or we offer this other individual reverence We're going to offer this reverence to our dear Lord on his throne because the altar is his throne, but the altar also is a symbol of him. So altar, incensing the altar, St. Ambrose, the first time we get a mention of this, now St. Ambrose died in 397. So when we get a first mention of something, that's not when we tend to think that's when it first started happening. When we first get a mention of it, we know it's been happening for a long time before that, right? But the first mention that we have that we can find in the writings of the fathers is, is from, from St. Ambrose. Now, we already have, when we get to Pseudo Dionysus in 500, we already have a liturgy fully developed when we incense the altar, how we're incensing the altar, when other things we're using incense for in the liturgy. By 500, we already have a full, a full liturgy where we use incense. Um, so it's an obvious sign of reverence. Incense, it used to be that when they'd get to the altar, they'd hang it up. So they'd be out there, they'd just hang it, you'd have this incense just billowing. They weren't using it, going and incensing the altar. Later, they started this rite for incensing the altar. Everything on the altar basically gets incensed. The altar gets incensed, well... The altar should be freestanding, and so you walk around it, incensing it with something they call an ictus, one swing. But now, if it's fixed against the wall, you, you have these, you know, these higher incense swings and these lower ones, and they have to do with like intending the back of the altar, the front of the altar, then the bottom of the altar, the side of the altar. Relics get incensed, the cross gets incensed. And even if the altator, offertory, which we'll talk about later, uh, there's an actual prayer, a psalm that you're saying while you're doing all of this. got a couple of typos it looks like but when it's blessed it's always blessed with it's a beautiful these these words be thou blessed by him in whose honor thou wilt be consumed amen abilo benedicaris in cuius honore cremabris that's the words the priest says whenever he blesses the incense puts his hand on the altar and he makes a sign of the cross over it and the the deacon always says uh, benedicite pater reverende and then he makes the, he make, he says this prayer. So it's also an act of, you know, be blessed. It, this incense receives its blessing by being consumed for God. It's also a nice prayer for us. Eh? And so that that quote from again that quote from Apocalypse, which talks about the uh, the saints in in uh, in heaven incensing the altar and in the liturgy we incense the altar we'll get to this too but we incense the altar from the right hand of the altar um, I think incensi adextrem adextrem altari incensi is what it says Saint Michael the Archangel it's really Saint Gabriel when he appeared to Zechariah it was at the right side of the altar when they showed up to, to uh, talk to Isaiah, right side of the altar. And so the prayer that's used is uh, ad dextera, right, um, altari and chensi, to the right of the altar of incense is what's said. So even today in the old liturgy, the server, if it's a requiem mass, the subdeacon himself, or during a high mass, the thoroughfare, they kneel at the right side of the altar, not in the center, 
They write right side of the altar and they incense from there because scripturally that's where the incense was always, the, the angels were always incensing uh, our Lord of the, the altar. Okay. okay. Let's stop right there. We'll take a quick break. First I'll get your questions and then, and then we'll, we'll cover um, a few other things. Any questions? There was, well, first let's get the, you've been waiting a long time. Yeah. Dominico. Well, yeah, because he has to. But he's not, he, they're not singing that. They have to sing that. And usually it's timed out. Sometimes he waits, sometimes he doesn't. But he can go down and sit. Uh, what it means there is like, if it's going to be a really long Benedictus, mm, Benedictus at Mass, you know, after the, or the uh, Sanctus, 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 then after that you have the Benedictus, uh, Qui Venet in Nomine Domini. So that's the Sanctus, Holy, Holy, Holy at Mass. If you do a really complicated one, it's so long that the, the priest, he's going through the canon, he'll get to consecration and they're still singing. He's not, he's, he's not allowed to sit there and wait, nor can he continue. So what they started to do is they, they broke the Sanctus and the Benedictus up on those really long ones. So you'd sing the Sanctus, they stop, and that gets him right to consecration. He says consecration, and then right after they start the Benedictus. And this is just one of these things that started, you know, maybe 500, I forget when they wrote that one, but it's, it's a magnificent and very solemn feast. But they did that because they are not to hinder the celebrant. They are only there as accompaniment. That's why the, the, the priest says everything at Mass, it's only repeated by the choir. Though the choir has a duty to say what's being, what's being uh, sung, the priest has a duty to say it because he's offering it and then they're accompanying it. That's why he doesn't wait on them. Question, Antonio? All oh, same thing. Um, what songs are appropriate to sing? I mean, I'm starting to think that we have a lot of songs that aren't appropriate. Oh, we have tons of them. They're absolutely. I mean, the, well, the, the, ma- the major problem is they're sentimental. They have sentimental stuff in the liturgy turns the liturgy into our our feelings, and that's why people. Don't go to that Mass because they don't like it, or they do go to that Mass because they like it. Well, we don't go to Mass because we like it or we don't like it. You go there because you want to serve and worship God. But if you notice in a lot of our churches, men don't go there anymore. Why? Because they can't take that kind of music. They don't know why they're not going, but it's, it's very effeminate. And not to offend anybody, but a lot of middle-aged women really like that sentimental stuff. The church that I, I go to sometimes on Sunday... You just got all these ladies like screaming and it's really hard because they're none of them are scre- I mean, I don't mean screaming, but they're, they're like they're like belting it out. But nobody's belting it out together. Everybody's kind of belting it out because they like this song and everybody's kind of belting it out here. But you look around, there aren't any men around. Where are the men go? It's because men can't take that kind of thing. It, men, men aren't as sentimental as women are by nature. Women are a bit more. That's not an offense against women. Uh, it just men and women are different in that, in, that, in that regard. But when we do something sentimental, it tends to attract more, more women to that, women who are a bit more sentimental. Um, so, well, we're supposed to be singing stuff that there are books for the new mass that are these antiphons. They're these antiphons, but they're in Gregorian. So when you open the whole liturgy up to participation and, and our, what we get from the liturgy is participation... Well, then you've got to have everybody sing it. Well, we can't have them sing anything because nobody can sing anymore. So you've got to have them sing these simple, like, kindergartner songs. They're like campfire songs. And we just sing this. A lot of them, unfortunately, were written by Protestants. And so now we have to, read, we have to sing these songs. Even in the, the New Breviary, a lot of those hymns are written by, like, you see Martin Luther's name right there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pray a psalm, and it says Martin Luther. And, and the, 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 I think this is problematic. But also because the theology is a bit off. It's not to say that some of these things can't be sung, but for example, that they sing the song um, of Saint Francis. You know that um, the prayer of Saint Francis. That's a beautiful prayer, but I hate that song. And the reason being is it invokes all kinds of sentimental stuff, and I don't want sentimental stuff at Mass. I, I don't. I don't want to get drawn to teariness only because some song is playing in the background. 
if I'm going to get if I'm going to get to teariness because I want to weep over my sins or because I'm immensely in love with God, but not because some song is, is irking at one of my sentimental chords in my lower faculties. Does that make sense? So it's difficult because in the in the new liturgy, unless you have people who are experienced in liturgy and you have like minded people who like that kind of music, you can't have that kind of music because you can't get anybody to agree on it anymore. I don't understand the Latin. I don't want to be around the Latin because I don't understand what they're saying. And the Gregorian, I can't sing along. So it becomes about me, me, me. And that makes it very difficult. So in the end, you're stuck with uh, the worship hymnal. I forget what that's called. The wor- Adoram- I, I forget. There's, there's one of them that is very famous in all the churches that... Well, they're all, yeah, I guess they're all about the same thing, though, aren't they? They do sell some uh, traditional hymn, uh, hymn books that were like pre-Vatican II, a lot of because those were Catholic songs that were liturgically sound. Uh, George Weigel even talks about saying, what we need is an index now for liturgical hymns. <laughs> an index meaning those things that no Catholic should ever sing because liturgically it will change or corrupt their faith if they pay attention to it. I mean, most people I don't think are paying any attention. Uh, the worst part about them most likely is that they're sentimental, which distorts our understanding why we're there. Because like I said, if, if it has to do with the way I feel, then eventually it's going to have everything to do with me and not not our Lord. And I think that's why our churches empty out, because you can find other things that are more attractive to do, really. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't, I don't know of a good way to answer it. It's a difficult question because that's a Catholic song. What I'm saying is Catholic songs are Catholic songs. Catholic hymns are Catholic hymns. But a lot of times we're doing stuff, they had to reinvent the wheel in the 70s. So we're singing a lot of stuff from the 70s, and it's always the same music over and over again. Um, I worked at camps for years and years, and when I go, when I go to Mass a lot of times, I just think, you know... This is just like the music we sang at camp around the campfire with the kids. And it was appropriate with the kids, but it just doesn't seem like, I don't see how it helps with what we're actually trying to do at Mass, the depth of Mass, how it's helping us to achieve that. In the end, it really seems like it's just filler. Um, That's a Catholic hymn, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all these Latin hymns, these are all these are all Catholic hymns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These are all, you'll find them in the breviary and everything as well. Yeah? Brother, I kind of disagree with you totally about the hymns and stuff. Because, like, let's take the incense, okay? At the very beginning, the Christians would throw themselves in the fire or throw themselves in the lines rather than use a bit of incense for some pagan God. Yet, through time... That same incense was used to praise God. So why is it that songs that are developed now through time don't feel the need? I mean, just like the incense. For two points, the, we, our theology never changes, and these songs have the wrong theology. Two, they're sentimental, and it has nothing to do with Catholic worship. Those are the two main points. That's why I'm not saying all hymns that are used in all of those books. I'm not saying that. I'm saying many of the hymns that we sing every Sunday or during the week, especially the ones written by Protestants, and there are quite a few of them, they're theologically incorrect. Now, that means we're saying things that don't add up to our faith. And the way we pray is the way we believe. Why is it that so many people don't believe the faith properly now? Maybe it has to do with that. I don't know. But it is a truth Lex orandi, lex credendi. And if we're putting that into the liturgy as our form of prayer, and what they're saying is incorrect, eventually we start to believe it, because you have basically, it's, we're condoning that. It's not to say every hymn that's in English, I'm not saying that one, one bit. There are all kinds of good hymns. But if we're going to make a hymn, and it's going to be in the vernacular, it needs to be something that is dignified and theologically correct. That's, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. If it's not, it should not be said in church. It's offensive. Does that make sense? It does, but I, I think the sentimentality, for me, it adds so much to the praise That's of the word, for me. For me. That's yes. right. In the subjective, if, if because it's, it's, it's objective worship, it's a, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, 
objectively, what is the worship of God? It has nothing to do with me. No, but for myself to, to enter that's that's into the point. The, uh, you need to, that. You got to go deeper. Right. If the sub the subjective is shallow. Or we need to go deeper than I feel good when they sing this song. I no, like I, this. It's not that I feel good. I feel like I'm praying to God. That I'm giving myself totally to God. And the, the music adds to that. It's not supposed to just be something that, okay, the mass goes on. And what does it mean to say, he who prays, he who sings prays twice? What's that mean? I think that you are praying same time you're giving yourself totally in song and praying at the same time here's what it means in gregorian chant you have two forms of prayer you have the deep prayer of the words that were written there and you have the notation which is theologically leading you through that prayer you have two expressions of that prayer the music and the words he who sings prays twice it has nothing to do with singing if I sing Kumbaya and I'm loving God through the, every, every word of it, that doesn't have anything to do with me praying twice. This has been so misunderstood that in, in one diocese I know of, they would sing the rosary so they would only pray half the rosary. This is, this is the point. Like Worship is an objective thing that we offer to God for His honor and glory. To sing something because I like it. Now, you're saying you think it helps you dispose you, but I think... The point I'm trying to make is, if something's sentimental, it's feeding on lower faculties. That means sentiments come from our lower, our lower faculties are these sentiments that are underlying. Uh, everybody knows in, mu- in movie making, if I put at this scene, this kind of music, everyone will start crying. But it's not really because that, that, that emotion's been invoked in you through what's happening there. It's because the music they put on there is making you cry. Everybody knows that's the way it works. These sentimental hymns are doing the same thing. It's not true love of God. It's a false love of God. Because true love of God is something where you have no feelings at all and you're willing to die for Him because you, you're bursting for love for Him. There's a, there's a huge difference between that. People who are sentimental in their worship tend not to be able to deal with difficulties in life because they find themselves unable. They don't understand why God isn't making them feel good. You hear it all the time. When there isn't a consolation, they're ready to abandon God. But the deeper Catholic, we, to become a saint, and the only way we can become a saint is if we can actually be completely dry and arid and feel nothing but long for God. Okay, then tell me why Christ uh, agonized in the garden and over his death. Or that his feelings were so strong and the emotion in him that he bled because he was so wrought with uh, fear and, and, and what he had to do and losing his life, but also for all the sins that bore down on him. Yeah. He didn't just walk in and say, okay, I'm going to die, guys, let's go. He was torn apart. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're supposed to be without emotion. But you just said that. You no. Said well, the emotions are well let's talk about it afterwards because that's not what I'm saying at all. And I don't want to. I don't want to hold everybody up. So we'll have to talk about it afterwards. Are there any other questions? You said the nanopole uh, in the pontifical uh, mass. He doesn't put it on until a couple parts are already done. And I thought we had talked about like with the regular high mass, the priest takes the nanopole off. It's kind of like a sign that the liturgy stops because he's going to get homily. And then when he puts the nanopole back on. Well, it's different. It seems to me he takes the maniple off because only a bishop preaches fully vested. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't really have to. T- there's there's two different. There's probably three different reasons, but two are the ones that make the most sense to me. One, a bishop preaches fully vested. He takes nothing off. A priest takes off at least the maniple as an act of reverence or an act of humility that he's not. He doesn't have the same. The other would be. Priests that preach and move their arms around a lot tend to wear this part of their vestment out. And if you don't take the maniple off, I mean, I used to go up to the priest all the time, but, Father, could you just take the maniple off? I mean, I know you like to wear it, but you're wearing out the vestment right here. So you try to get them to take it off. So that's a practical reason. Take the maniple off, swing your arms all you want to. 
and then you save the vestment because they're very. It's, once you wear this part out, you got to basically got to patch the whole thing up. And but the other one would be well, it's an act of humility because only a pre, only a bishop preaches fully vested. Because we do say that the liturgy stopped, but the homily is part of the liturgy. I know some people say it's not; it is, but it's always always been there, and it's prescribed on these days. You have to do it. Uh, it really is instruction uh, for the for the people, whatever. But um, it's kind of a difficult one to say: is it actually, is it not part of the liturgy? So I think the one about the bishop or saving the vestment is probably a, a safer safer bet. The Kyrie is, is taken on a kind of a drastic form. A lot of times we tend to think that the Kyrie itself is just a, a vestige, something that was left over from when the liturgy itself was in Greek in Rome. That's not true. <clears throat> it was actually a later development, the Kyrie, and it came into the Roman rite in Greek. So it wasn't part of the, the earlier uh, the earlier lit- liturgies. There are only two times that Greek is used in the Roman rite, and that's at every Mass, the Kyrie. And it's funny because had we had a bishop once that he didn't want to choose any Latin. It was a new Mass, and he didn't want to choose any Latin. So he said, you can do the Kyrie in Latin. And we all were in the sacristy. We started giggling. Should somebody tell him it's in Greek? <laughs> So anyways, but um, then the other one's uh, Trisagion, it's, uh, it's, it's on Good Friday, we're getting ready to hear that. The Adoration of the Cross, you also, those are the, the prayers that are in the, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, Holy God, Holy Mighty One, uh, what, what's the other one, Holy, Holy Immortal One, it basically comes from the um, uh, Trisagion, it's, it's the Greek and Latin that's in during the adoration of the cross. That's the beautiful stuff they're singing. Hopefully you'll get to hear that this Friday. Uh, Rome, it came into the Roman liturgy from the east in the 6th century. So a little bit before Pope Gregory the, the first, Pope Gregory the Great. It entered from Antioch, again Antioch. Remember, we, 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 they started calling us Catholic at Antioch. They started calling us Christians at Antioch. It's an important place. Uh, so in the 4th century this came in they were using it at Antioch and in Jerusalem we have no mentions from the fathers before the 4th century of the Kyrie being used in the, in the liturgy no mention of it whatsoever um, until we get to uh, St. John Chrysostom he, he talks about it uh, quite a bit Now, this came to us in the form of a litany. And what we see today from our Kyrie, and we'll see it again on Saturday, it's another vestige of this litany that would happen. So there would be the Kyrie eleison, and then later they start in, in, in Rome, they started to say Christe eleison. And then there would be this whole litany. That litany ended with a hymn, and that hymn ended with a prayer. And so now we start to see... Well, hopefully we'll get to, this is the, the first part of the liturgy all the way to the collect. So this, this, open, this is the opening prayer. This is the first prayer that's being said in the Mass. Make sense? Everything else before was a psalm, it was an antiphon, uh, it was something else. But this is the first prayer in the Mass that's now being said. Because the introit was just said before this, the priest goes up, makes the sign of the cross, and he reads the introit while it's being sung by the choir now. Uh, he's saying that, but that's not a prayer. That's, that's a hymn with an antiphon. So now we have him saying the Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, and this is us appealing uh, to our Lord. So it's a prayer. This comes into play around the year 500, and already by you know, 590, the end of that century, Gregory the Great, he writes a letter, because they also had a, a synod where they were talking about this, um, the new key, it's mentioned in that synod for the first time where they're talking about this kind of how, how you use the Kyrie eleison in the Mass. And Gregory the Great's already talking about it, how it's used with the litany, and it's different. We say Kyrie eleison and Christe eleison. Daily Mass, he says, there is no litany. And at major feast days on Sunday and other days, they would have the, the litanies with the Kyrie eleison. So eventually, this practice of saying the Kyrie eleison. A daily mass without the litany 
became the Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison that we now have today. Do you see? And most likely that litany, it also got replaced over time by the Gloria because the litanies all ended with a hymn and the Gloria in Excelsis Deo uh, is the hymn. So since the, the hymn started to be said more often, it started to replace this litany. So then you start to get these, this is organic development guided by the Holy Spirit. You see how we something comes in and over time it gets purified and this gets kind of left out or it gets left in for a couple of things. This Saturday what we're going to see is the priest goes back to bless the baptismal, baptismal font. This is extraordinary liturgy, extraordinary form liturgy. Uh, and on the way back, starts chanting the litany. The priest prostrates himself in front of the altar while they're singing the litany. And finally, he goes to the sacristy to get ready for Holy Mass. He comes back when they're saying, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. And he starts Mass with, Gloria in excelsis Deo. You see how that we, in, in Holy Saturday, we see all this stuff that we no longer do anymore still trapped, no, not trapped, preserved in the archaic form of the Holy Liturgy that was untouchable, the, the Sancto Sanctorum, which was the, the Holy Week Liturgy, was untouchable because it was so holy. Okay, and we see the same thing at, with, with Sunday because it's basically a, a repeat liturgy. Ba- doing the baptismal font, everything, that's the day before Pentecost. Uh, and then they also you do, do it at ordinations. You have the litany at ordinations, which also comes from, they used to do the litany at ordinations with the Kyrie and all that, and we still have that in ordinations today. So these are the vestiges where it still remains in our liturgy that we see coming back from the 500s. Today, in the extraordinary form of the liturgy, it's locked to a Trinitarian form. What's that mean? You say it nine times. How's that Trinitarian? You say Kyrie eleison three times. You say Christe eleison three times. And you say Kyrie eleison three times. So, in God the Father, there's God the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. In God the Son, there's in Christ... There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Christe eleison. And then the same for um, the Holy Ghost. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Yes. Now they do it, I think it's um, uh, two sets of three. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. I think that's the way it goes now. The glory, the glory, uh, the Gloria, uh, which is referred to as the Hymnus Angelicus, uh, the Dexologia Major, Dexologia. That's the Dexology, Doxology Major. It's just, it's like a major form of this glorification of the Holy Trinity. The glory be, but extended in a major way. And it comes from an early Greek writing that was used in their divine office, their divine liturgy, not in Mass. Now you're saying, well, the angels sang that. They did, but they, they didn't sing the whole thing. Scripture says, Gloria in excelsis Deo, et pax hominibus. Uh, and then the rest of it's written by, uh, we believe, well, who wrote it, we're not sure, the Greek. But it was translated and rearranged by St. Hilary Portier, a doctor of the church, in the year three, well, he died in the year 366. And like we said, because of this, it seems to be that when this hymn started to come in, it started to replace the litany itself. It became customary in the third century to make use of the great doxology in the liturgy. But as I said, that was the divine office. By the 400s, it was ordered as a hymn by Pope uh, Sumacus. Sumacus. It was to be said on Sundays and on the birthday of martyrs, meaning the day that they died. A martyr's birthday is the day he died because he's born into heaven. Now, there became a... um, Little by little, it started to kind of be used in different points. Only the bishops could use the glory in excelsis Deo. Only bishops. 
And then, and that was only for like Sundays and Easter time. And then they started to use it at Christmas, which we think is strange. It should have been used at Christmas. Then finally, some priests started to complain. These complainers sometimes can get stuff done. And then they complained that priests couldn't, um, why didn't priests get to say it? Because there was a difference between a priest mass and, a, and the, uh, the mass of a, of a bishop. So finally, permission was given for priests in their masses. They could say it on Easter and they could say it at their ordination day. And then it changed just to Easter. And then finally, by, Pius the, by, by the time Pope Pius V came along, he established for the entire church the Gloria to be said on, um, at Mass is basically the way it's said today. So the Gloria in Excelsis Deo is said whenever the Te Deum is said. That doesn't mean anything to you because you don't know where we're saying it. The Te Deum is said on feast days in the office. So if it's, um, if it's a feast day... Uh, third class or more, so of any kind of saint or a martyr or anything like that, then we pray the, the Te Deum at the end of the long office. If you pray the Te Deum, then you pray the Gloria. If you pray the Gloria, then you have a uh, Ita Misa Est at the end of Mass. And this is kind of these, these things, they all regulate each other. It also meant that the Pope, which we'll get to next, he would say uh, Pax Vobis when he would address the people before the first prayer. So it's all regulated by what kind of liturgy it was. Was it a solemn liturgy? Was it not a solemn liturgy? Was it of a joyful nature? Was it of a, of a somber nature? So the collect. It comes from the Greek word synaxis. Um, it collects you... And it, I, Basically, this word comes, this prayer was when they had the statio. Um, the statio was the stations in Rome. So on the, on the feast day of a martyr, everybody would meet up in that church. And even in the Roman Missal today, and even to recently in the New Order Mass, they even had it written in there in a lot of places, the stations. I don't think they, they published that anymore. I'd have to see maybe some versions do. Uh, but it's not kept really anymore. Even in the old missal, it's written, but it wasn't kept really anymore. Some people are trying to revive it, but it's not, it doesn't do all that well. So what they would do is they would go to a church where a certain saint was. They would have, everybody would meet there. They'd say certain prayers. The collectio uh, would be said there. And then they would process all together to a, a place where they were going to say a mass. Or they would meet at a certain church and process to where they were going to say the mass of that martyr that day. These are the stations. And every day at Rome had a different station, basically, a different place where these masses could be said. And oftentimes the Pope himself went there and said masses at these locations. But the collectio comes from that group of people coming together, meeting that place to, to, to do a litany. Interesting, another litany comes in to do a litany to get to that other place where they're going to have mass. They finish the litany always with a hymn, which could have been the Gloria to Chelsea's Deo. And then there's always a prayer at the end of that, the litany. And the, even today, we have a prayer at the end of the litanies. And we have a collectio. And then they would have started Mass. Seems like we have, a, we have a pattern here that we see in the ancient church that came down to us somehow. So the, the collectio is written in a particular way. It's considered, nowadays, the way we write them since probably the middle of the well, even probably the early 20th century, new prayers started to kind of lose the Roman, the, the Roman style. And the Roman style is considered to be perfect. These prayers were written perfectly. And I'll show you the next slide. I'll talk about that. But we don't know where they come from. We don't know who wrote them. We just have a prayer for every single day. Every different mass has its own prayer. And they're written very precisely, uh, with, with the greatest of eloquence, it, and it has to do with the, the Latin language. When, when the language was in Greek, it was very flowery, kind of like it is today. We write these, we just had the Feast of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, and the prayer for that, it, it, I mean, it's like a paragraph, because it's, it's a modern feast that we have, and it's really, really long, whereas usually you've got like four sentences, and that's your whole prayer, because it was so precisely and perfectly written 
Those really short prayers go all the way back to we don't even know when, but they were already showing up in the very first sacramentary that we have. By the time that first sacramentary comes down to us in the 400s to 300s, we already have all these prayers. Who wrote them? Where'd they come from? We, we have no idea. The arrangement is complete. We've only added to them since then. Before this prayer is said, there has to be a greeting of the people. And that greeting of the people is where you get the Dominus Vibiscum. So the priest is over on the side of the altar or the, the bishop's at his throne. And he, they say the Gloria. Then after that, he would, if it's a bishop and there was a Gloria, he would turn to the people and he would say, Pax Vobis. Um, this is, it occurs quite often. A priest would say, Dominus Vobiscum. And that's what we get mostly. So he kisses the altar and needs to, he's going to pray to God for the people. So what does he do? He addresses the people. It's a salutation, right? Uh, but it's not good morning, everyone. It's a salutation that has everything to do with him being a mediator before God. That's why he's kissing the altar. There's a relic there. He's bowing down before God. He's kissing the altar, which represents Christ. And in that altar is a representative also of the church triumphant. And now he's going to address the church militant. So as mediator between heaven and earth, he first greets, this is one way they explain it, he first greets the church triumphant, kisses the altar, and then he shares also that peace that comes from Christ with everyone else. Dominus vobiscum, the Lord be with you. That is the most ancient form that we use in the Mass today, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit is what we say. The priest puts his hands like this. In the old mass, he puts his hands like this, or at least he's extending his hands outward just for that prayer as a way of communicating to the people. However, he immediately brings his hands back together as he turns back to the altar to extend them again before the Lord. Because what he's going to do is intercede now for the people. So as an act of humility and reverence before God, he relies on God. He turns back from the people, not having the confidence in himself, but turns to God and does the same thing. Oremus, let us pray, bowing to the Lord and then saying the prayer with extending his hands. This also could be considered a sign of the cross in different ways. The composition... Um, some people say that these, these, these prayers were made by Pope uh, Damasus. Now, he was the one that helped have the... the um, with St. Jerome, he had scriptures translated. But he was very Roman. And they said that the, his Roman perfection, the, the style of his, his Roman style, seems to be what contributed to these, but it's all speculation. We don't know if he did it or didn't do it. Just a lot of people say that he did. So the thing, the characteristics of these, these prayers, and then we'll close, is that they're short. They ask one thing. They're only asking one thing. Remember our Lord says, don't go on and on. Ask one thing. Uh, the, 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 of the Tarsus language, most, most concise, and the petition is very general. It's very general because it leaves for the people to have precise petitions. Normally after this let us pray, there's a brief pause where the people can pray. In the old liturgy, what we'll see on Friday, you have the prayers. Uh, the, all the prayers of the priest stands in the middle of the altar, and he just prays, Oremus, let us pray for. We pray for the pontiff. We pray for uh, the pagans. We pray for the Jews. We pray for uh, the leadership, whatever. We're going through praying for everybody. This is a remnant, probably, of what was going on here at the college. These Roman prayers, the flectamus genoa, let us kneel, let us rise. There's a moment there where we're able to pray and contribute to this prayer in a more specific manner. Maybe we know how we want to pray for the Pope or the, those persecuted. We know people, whatever. The prayer itself is general, leaving space for our particular petitions. Not to be said out loud, but in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in our hearts. Here's an example. Here's an example of the prayer. So let me read it without the, the highlight. So, O oh God, who today by the light of the Holy Ghost did instruct the hearts of the faithful, give us by the same Holy Spirit 
a love for what is right and just and constant, uh, a constant enjoyment of his comforts through Christ our Lord. And it would be, Per Dominum Nostrum Jesum Christum Fidium Tum Qui Tecum Vivida Terrenia Trinitate Spiritu Santi Deus, Per Omnia Secula Seculorum. Amen. We have no idea who wrote that ending, but whoever wrote it, it was so long ago, we've always used that ending. It's the most used formula in the Catholic Church, and it's the most magnificent ending to a prayer. Even if you were to analyze it according to its syllables and the way it's sung, it's, it's of absolute perfection. It rolls right off the tongue in the most beautiful way, uh, and it's never been changed. It's, it's, it's magnificent. And the things we have no idea where it even came from. There are other ways you can end a prayer, but that's the most predominant will in you. So, oh God, we elevate our heart and our soul to God. That's prayer, elevation of heart and mind to soul uh, or to God. And then we have our we have our thanksgiving. Who today, by the light of the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, did instruct the hearts of thy faithful? See, we're thankful for that because He did that. This is for Pentecost. This uh, this prayer, or Whit Sunday, I think. And now the petition, give us by the same Holy Spirit a love for, for what is right and just and constant enjoyment of his comforts. This last petition always has two parts to it. And then you end with the supplication. Per Dominum Nostrum Jesum Christum Fidium Tuum, qui tecum who lives and reigns without end forever and ever. Amen. World without end. Amen. Questions? No questions. Yet? I, I need to see all the tweets from, from from Trump to find out what's and I don't have I don't have anything I don't know how you even get tweets, I'm not sure, so or twits or tweets, I'm not sure what they're called. I don't know, I mean and, you know, it's happened a lot in the past. You have, um, I don't know if you know, but St. John Lateran burnt down basically the day the Pope left for Avignon. <laughs> then uh, his cathedral burnt to the ground. But that happened because workers left a little fire burning. Um, in the 1800s, um, St. Paul outside the walls burnt to the ground. And that just seems to be something they're working on the roof and somebody little, you know, they have to have a fire to get the tar. And they left this little flame there, burnt, the whole thing burnt to the ground. So there's like in St. Paul outside the walls, there's two pillars in the front of the sanctuary. Same thing at St. John Lateran. There's a couple of the pillars that are still the old pillars. And there's still a couple of pillars in the back part because the back part didn't get as much damaged. That were actually from Constantine's palace that those are still intact, but um, yeah, it, it just got completely destroyed. And that's where you get the modern, kind of modern, bold edifice that you have today, St. John Ladder. Um, I don't know, I don't really have a take on it. I didn't follow it, somebody, my, my, my father had called me and then I got a couple of people has fired me off emails letting me know about it, but I don't really know. So, I mean, it could be, we don't deserve to have that beauty anymore. We just don't deserve to have beauty like that anymore. I mean, I've been, I've been there in the sacristy. We would have the, the pilgrimage from Our Lady of Notre Dame to Our Lady of Chartres. Um, 70 miles, traditional pilgrimage. About 15,000 people go on it every year. It's magnificent. You can't see the beginning of the, the line walking. It just, it's just the people infinitely walking down. In these. Well, we got there in the sacristy, and they just got all these rainbow vestments. In, uh, encased in shrines as though it's like a museum, rainbow vestments. I mean, I'm not saying that's why God burnt the place down, but it, it was just sad. It, it, the things I saw there were just sad. So maybe it's that, maybe it's not. So who knows? Any other questions? Okay, we can just say a quick prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us.